25 years. 25 years. <laughs> so the reason that we got him here was the, was the workshop. It started the whole thing going, yeah. and yeah. it really worked. Very good. Thank you very much. What's his name? Reed. That's an old Russian name. You may not have heard of it. It's like Peter's. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> you call me the Rusin Ringer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so we have people from Lewiston, New York, Tunt County, New Jersey, where about New Brunswick. New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, you're from uh, McCungy. You're from Coldale. Anybody else want to tell me where they're from? <laughs> <laughs> Connecticut. Connecticut from where? Connecticut, Oxford. Oxford, Connecticut. John Moore, John. George, George. No, George John. Uh, Jack. Jack. Okay. He gets the last word. Is that the way it works? Uh, we're the last one to let you down. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and Nashville, Pennsylvania, down by the Speedway. And uh, sir. Windsor, New York. Windsor, New York. Kingsley, Kingsley Pennsylvania. Jack is from Pittston, West Pittston? Pittston. Pittston. And Tom, you're from Carville. Chatley. Chatley. Yeah. But the very first trend, can't get a bit stuff when we get you started. The very first trend in the United States, you know his name? No. Marion. You related to him somehow? I believe so. I haven't found the link yet, but yeah. <laughs> oh. The United States government, when it was formed, they had no money to pay Mr. Meredith for all the money he helped uh, pay for the revolution. So they gave him a whole bunch of land up here in northeastern Pennsylvania. That's why Meredith Street, and that's why Tom Meredith was here. <laughs> <laughs> it might be a stretch. <laughs> I want to find the money. <laughs> yeah, right. Show me the money. Uh, but his statue is up in Fort Epping, present month. Right. right. That would be very good enough, but there's a big monument. Uh, they got his headstone. Yeah, his headstone. Joe, I'm curious, how did all these wonderful people find out about this our PSAs? This is our publicity today? lady. She always wants to know how our PSAs are working out. <laughs> so let's just go through this. Dr. Sembra, you're from Allentown, right? Yes. How did you find out about us? One of my friends, uh, Dr. Squeer, is uh, Ukrainian, or a Polish, or whatever you want to call it, introduced me to the Wisdom Society. Actually, excuse me, but I was accepted as a Ukrainian, likely, originally. And uh, so the town is finding out the behavior of Alvin's convicted mothers of all my mom's side, the Slovakian, the Ukrainian people on my dad's side, and also, I guess, the, uh, the Polish people. So you gave me the information. I called you, Joe, as a friend of mine from Fort Street, Blakely, from 50 years 50 ago. 50 years ago, we haven't seen each other, right? So, um, it was a yeah. very pleasant yeah. We live a few houses apart. We haven't seen each other 50 years. Wow. <laughs> wow. But this brought us together. Okay, I'm from New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is about 35 miles as the crow flies from Manhattan. And I've been, you know, dabbling a bit to the extent that I go into the archives branch in New York City to look up the microfilm of ship arrival manifests. One day I picked up a little flyer about this genealogical society in Oliphant. I said, oh, my parents, when my dad retired, they settled in northeastern Wayne County. Uh, and so coming up to visit, we'd be out and around in Carbondale, we'd be over to Sugarman's, which I missed, my dad had <laughs> a yeah. car in Scranton. I said, oh, <coughs> I'm up there. I know all of that. I'll find them. So I did. Very good. <laughs> Gary, could you ask anybody to introduce their names? We're going to do that. Yes, we're doing that. We're at your interview, and tell us where they're from. They're practicing now. And this is Barbara Filsky. Filsky. Filsky, but from New Brunswick, New Brunswick, New Jersey. New Jersey. This lady from Nashville, Pennsylvania. What's your name, please? Sharon Fierro. And how'd you find out about it, Sharon? About this meeting? Oh, well, I'm kind of a volunteer here, and yeah. I transferred to St. Michael's um, Cemetery. Cemetery, right. Uh, how I found out, my grandparents immigrated to Dunmore. And a couple of years ago, I started my research and had no idea kind of what we were, who we were, but as an aunt. And I couldn't find where Castrino was, the village where my grandfather came from. And after about two years of researching, I found it, and then I got very interested. And uh, the trip of my lifetime was to go with John Rigetti to uh, the homeland oh, and actually find the village and find another relative. Can't connect. 
Sharon lives in uh, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, you know, down by the Speedway, but she comes up to Dunmore to, what cemetery is that? St. Michael's? Michael's. And she walks the cemetery and writes all the stuff down from the tombstones, enters it into a computer, sends it to us as an attachment by email, and we enter it into our master computer. Barbara does the same thing. She cuts out, she must get 100 newspapers to deliver to her house. <laughs> and she cuts, out, four. <laughs> she cuts out all the obituaries for anybody in New Jersey or New York or... It's all the obituaries who have a connection to your six focus counties. Right. Okay. And she mails that to us. We send it to a girl who then enters it to a computer. All right, and, and sent it to our database. Jack, you're from Dunmore? Well, yeah, my name's Jack Chipak. I'm a funeral director. <laughs> I have two funeral homes, one in Dunmore and one in Scranton. We need to talk <laughs> about St. Michael's Cemetery. That would be very helpful. Yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes people don't know where people are buried. Yet. And we're letting them find out that some of us are related and don't even know it yet. Right. Okay, Mr. Reed, let's go to you if we can. Uh, oh, wow. You found out about us how? On, on, on the web, I was uh, looking through a few of the um, email houses that I get stuff from, and Somebody had a Liberente or one of them said uh, that there was going to be a seminar, and that's how I started. It's so when I give you a call. Well, I went out, I sent an email, and then I gave you a call, and you called down. And, and I thought it was strange. He was coming up here just for a seminar, but he said he had relatives up there. He right. seen it well, I was years. born and raised here. So he, so he made a double right. trip, right? Right. But I think it's nice. Did you see the power you have? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 like I said, I've been read, reading some of his articles. Uh, because they, they have them on different parts of the web. And um, uh, I haven't been up here in a long time. And after I moved south, it's very difficult to come back up to the cold country. Yes. <laughs> and it was cold this morning. Oh, yes. Yes. So yes, this, we haven't had it this cold since March. Have not uh, had a scrape of windshield for about 15 or 20 yes, years. Man. Did this morning. Don't, <laughs> Don't say that to Tom. We'll be moving. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> it was not fun. I'm going right, home. Thanks. Sir, how'd you, your name and where you're from and how'd you find out about us? I'm Andy Ravage. Uh, I live up big of, by Binghamton, New York. And uh, I found out about the genealogy place from Joe down in Lackawanna Courthouse. And he <laughs> sent me up here to see you and you're the one that told me about the meeting. Uh, but uh, I uh, had uh, found out about the Carpathian Russian uh, society and I went to Europe with them this summer uh, on the uh, trip to uh, uh, Ukraine and Poland and uh, uh, Slovakia and I went to my parents uh, villages uh, there and both of them over there but, but I found out about the society for my <coughs> Eastern Catholic paper looking for a cookbook and when that came back it gave me information <laughs> about the Russian society which Prompted me to go down to Lackawanna Courthouse where I met Joe. Says he knows you and he set me up here. Joe Cheney from Binghamton. Yeah. Uh, or Endicott or something. Yeah. He's a retired IBMer. Are you a retired <laughs> IBMer too? Or? Uh, no, I work for New York State or okay. DO10. Okay. All right. Uh, these lovely folks. We live here. We live very near here in Kingsley. And I used to live in Austin, but you may, I never knew you were here at all. And <laughs> I was on the web, found the Carpeta Russian Society website joined the one in Pittsburgh, and in reading their newsletter, found a little thing about this place here in Oliphant, and said, oh my God, you know, and found out then about the workshops we do. Uh, to our newsletter, he could get. Yes, right. exactly. Everybody's going to get a copy of our newsletter anyhow, the last <coughs> newsletter, so you see what we do. Uh, Barbara, we got you from a country. You want to tell us how you heard about us? Hi, I'm, I'm Joni Wilgus uh, from the Lehigh County area. I found out through a priest one of the priests, and I can't remember which church, maybe it was St. Michael's, but there is a St. Michael's in Simpson, and I got a lot of information from him. I have relatives in Fort City, Barbendale, Simpson, and uh, I've been trying to look at both my father and my mom's side, but it's been difficult because no one kept records. Uh, so I'm just going by their names, and, and their spellings are all different, Benarchik, Benarik, Stress. Bruce, um, Shedlock, or uh, was uh, Sheshek, or, uh, you know, the yes. S and the Z's and the C's, and all consonants. So I figured I'd, I'd need to talk with Joe here, and when I heard Tom was coming, I asked Joe if I could come, and he said yes. Uh, <laughs> and I gave him a headache. <laughs> uh, I'm Joe Herbert, I'm from Coldale, and I heard it through the Cafe uh, de Lucent. Uh, and uh, but when I, my mother was 80 years 
old, we went to Europe and took her to Europe. And her home is still there. It's been in the family for over 450 years. Mm. But there's wow. Polish people living in it. And uh, my mother, I remember from a kid high, I loved the trip. From a kid high, all I heard was about study cry, about the old country. Right. And here it is in front of me. <laughs> and uh, so uh, and my mother asked, uh, they had a family room. And in the family room, they had open beans. And every owner who lived on the farm, his name was carved into the beans, the years he served on his name and the years he served on the farm. So my mother asked the lady, uh, is the uh, name still in the beans? And she said, yes. And she said, can my son take a picture? And he said, uh, no, because they put a drop ceiling in. And, uh, but our name, we go Herbert, but our real name is Herb Butt, Ed Foot. And when my father got a job in a coal mine, the bosses were English and Welsh, mm -hmm. so they anglicized the Right, Right. Very nice. Now, since you're a PSA lady and you live in Titanic, tell us how you found out about it. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us a little bit about yourself, will you please? I found out about society, uh, seeing um, it advertised that you were holding a workshop at Bodcom about three years ago. So I attended and I've been hooked ever since. And I think I have a connection to Carpatha Rus on my mother and grandmother's side. Okay, very good. Well, Mr. Peters, I'm sure, is going to straighten out everybody today. You're going to all be thrilled that you came, and, and we're going to hear. But no one knows more about the Carpathia Rusans in America than this man. Trust me. So uh, I have to look to it. So <laughs> I'd like to introduce Tom Peters. Thank you. I hope by the end of the day, I'm going to give you back something that you may have already or may not, and that is a pride in your specific brand of ethnicity, the Carpato Russos. All right, and I'll get into all the names we've used for ourselves, etc., to uh, explain our identity crisis, because that's what we have. We know who we're not, but we don't know. Who and that's why I do this. This is my uh, spread the gospel. I tell our priest at church, I'm spreading the gospel to the Carpathia Rus. And he's one of us, and he understands that. There are not many priests that understand that. I can assure you of that. I'm going to say things today that perhaps you might be uncomfortable with. We have to deal with ethnicities, we have to deal with rivalries, and so on. Please understand that these are not necessarily my feelings, but these are. It's a piece of history, and we have to deal with it, whether it makes us uncomfortable or not. So uh, we'll have to let the chips fall where they may, but I have nothing against any particular ethnic groups that we're going to talk about. All right, I might as well get into it. My wife will do the slides, because the, the technology never seems to work too well. All right, yeah, we need to let totally out, probably. Yeah. Now, I've been talking specifically about the people from Carpatho Rus for about 13 years. And uh, I decided after reading about our people and learning everything that I could about them, I decided we came from a place called no man's land because we can never explain to our fellow Americans where this place called Carpatho Rus or Ruthenia, the old Latin where where it was in the world. We could not explain that to people. And they really are, our people settled in, in areas, mountain valleys, where the land was very poor for farming. Yet we took on the challenge. We made the land work for us. We lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years. But it was really land that nobody else wanted. The Hungarians moved in first. And of course, they got all the fertile land on the plains and all the rocky mountain soil, which is suitable mainly for potatoes and other crops, was left to the Rusans. But we came from a place called, that I call no man's land. But the real, the real title of the talk, that's our people, you people, and the village people. All right, now I 
Y-M-C-A. Don't worry, forget that. <laughs> Next slide. Yeah. I work in one of these LDS family history centers, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. And I get people from all walks of life coming in, and Tom, I'm just starting out, can you help me? And usually the first thing I'll say, well, what's your background? What are your ethnicities? If I get this, it, I know right away I'm dealing with a Carpeto Russo. They're the only ones that start out by saying, uh, I don't know, something like Russian, Slavish. Uh, you never get the correct answer. Never. Right away, I know we're dealing with a Rusin. All right, now my wife is not a Rusin. I always tell people she's a, a wannabe. <laughs> she's Irish and German, Mayflower type. And uh, I had to really give her my background in detail because before I came along, we married five years ago. She didn't know what a carpet a Rusin was, and she didn't know that there were other churches besides the Roman Catholic. <laughs> this is a foreign concept. After, after 16 years of Catholic study, he did not know there was a, such a group as a Byzantine Catholic mm -hmm. or Orthodox. This was a foreign concept. Mm -hmm. So, we started the education process. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, we back up. We got something better. <coughs> uh, something All right, we'll get to that. Anyway. So, how, how did... How do you decide whether or not you're Rusin? I've done a lot of study, 20 years worth of study on this. And after all the scholarly research, I finally cracked the code. I know how we determine our ethnicity. The dartboard technique. <laughs> and we never hit the bullseye, which is Carpeto Rusin. That's who we are, all right? Number one answer, ding, Slavish. I am Slavish. I'm sure this is a common term amongst people in this room. If your parents or grandparents said you were Slavish, I guarantee 101% that you are Carpeta Rusa. They're the only people in the United States to use that term. Slavish. You will not find in the dictionary because it's a made-up word. It means I look like a Slovak, I act like a Slovak, I eat like a Slovak or a Slav. But I'm not really a Slovak, <laughs> and I'm not really Polish, and I'm not really Ukrainian. This is the word that they sort of made up and spread around their community. So the Americans would understand. Uh, there are those are people from Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Our next favorite, I'm Punashi. What does that mean to somebody from the U.S.? It means nothing, absolutely nothing. You're saying, you're using words in the Rusin language. Punashi means our way or our manner. It's people that look like us, eat the same kind of foods, or talk like us. It's Punashi. The only ones that will understand when you say Punashi there's another Pornashim, another, another Rusin will understand what you're saying. Our priest had a habit of saying to me in conversation, well, Tom, that priest in the other parish, he's not Nash. What was he saying? <laughs> he's not one of us. He's one of these outsiders. He's uh, Irish or whatever. He, he became a Byzantine priest for whatever reason. <coughs> so he's not going to understand the background of the people in his parish. You know, we have certain mindsets. I don't, uh, I don't know if you believe that, but we'll, we'll get into yeah. that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that's the way it is. The people that go to the Byzantine Catholic Church, and I guess that's another sore point with me. You know, there are 22 churches that make up the Catholic Church, and there are about a dozen of the Byzantine cult rites in the Catholic Church. And everyone has a different name, the Syrian Catholics, the Ukrainian Catholics, and so on. The Ruthenian Catholic Church, the only ones that say that we're Byzantine are the Ruthenians. The Ukraine, you'll never hear a Ukrainian saying I'm a Byzantine. You'll never hear a Syriac saying it, et cetera, et cetera. The Ukrainian 
Ukrainians are a part of the Byzantine Catholic Church. No. But we're the Byzantine Ruthenian right, right, or autonomous ritual church. But the, the only members that will say we're Byzantines are the, quote, Ruthenian rights. Yes. I get a little technical about this. I'm Roman Catholic. Right. Byzantine right is Byzantine right. Ukrainians have their rights. So if they are Ukrainian right, that is separate from Byzantine right. It's very a, technical, no. very legal. Few people understand <laughs> no, that. No, that's, that's not my interpretation. They're one of the they're one of the Byzantine liturgical rites. They are separate from the Ruthenians, they're separate from the Syrians and so on. They're separate, but they're considered a part of the Byzantine ritual churches. That, that I'm quite sure. Uh, so we have the root quote, oh, I'm Ruthenian, sorry. And again, has only a concept uh, amongst people that would know that you're Eastern Catholic. Okay. We have the Carpatho-Russians. Those are our same brethren that for various reasons no longer belong to the Greek Catholic or what is now Byzantine Catholic Church and have joined Russian Orthodox churches. And we're from the time the Russian Orthodox Church began in America and the Rusins joined and formed these various parishes, the priests who were largely, at least later on, Russian trained <coughs> would say, well, you're, you're Russians, but you're Carpathian. And they reinforced that over the years. So I've gotten into many of the quote discussion with the people from these parishes that they're Carpato Russian. We might be Russian in a very general sense, uh, uh, anthropological sense, but we're not really quote Russian. Our term in our language for our people is Ruski. And you know, the, the American movies, not easy. See, or oh, there's a Ruski. They're talking about a Russian person from mm -hmm. Moscow, but there is a big difference. And then I call these are the French peoples. These are people that are Russian, but they say, well, I'm not Russian, I'm not Ukrainian, I'm not Slovak, and I'm not Polish. <laughs> That's a negative identification for yourself. That's telling me who you are not, not who you are. So I put this here because we have an identity problem. And we need to know that's how we should identify ourselves, either as Rusin or Carpatho, if we're going to be technical. Now, there are people now in my own parish that have come over within the last 50 years from Europe, from Rusin villages, and they say they're Slovak. Why? Because for 50 years they were beat over the head and said, you're really Slovak. Uh, nationalistically, they were Slovak because they came from Slovakia. Mm -hmm. Just like we're Americans, we, we come from America. But their minority status was they were Russian. But they are so Slovak guys now that you can't have a conversation. They know the Russian national anthem, blah, blah, blah. But Tom, it's easier to say we're Slovak. Than <laughs> This is a fluid kind of situation. Okay. Next. The next slide is me. Does it make a difference? That's good. Okay. Now this is up here. <laughs> and for those in the <coughs> audience that perhaps don't have a spouse of your own Russian ethnicity, if you're going to get into discussions with them about who you are and particularly about churches, if you're going to try to explain the religious history, for whatever reason, of the Russians. This is the response you're going to get. Every time I try to do it with Catherine, she either says, I'm getting a headache, <laughs> or uh, can't we talk about the Yankees? <laughs> Anything but. Sometimes I get this. I usually get that. <coughs> and I'll explain that with the next one. Now, Rusins began settlement in the United States in 1884. The first parish was in Shenandoah, here in eastern Pennsylvania. It's now uh, 
a Ukrainian Catholic parish. And this paper was started by Russian immigrants for the Russian community in 1894. Now, we came in 84. And I used to think, well, in 84, there weren't very many Russians here. In 94, they started a newspaper. So probably for those 10 years, the Russians were a relatively quiet, peaceful period. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Next. Here are some of the slides, uh, some of the newspaper headings from that paper in the early years. You see that we were 10 years into being in America, and already we're talking schisms, <laughs> problems, and these were the more mundane problems. I couldn't put some of the scurrilous headlines about various things said about the early clergy in, mm -hmm. in America. I want to point this one out right here. Troublemakers and schizophrenic trends. Now, if I had a slide, I would put it up showing the DNA molecule. <laughs> And I would point to a specific strand on that molecule. And I would tell you, each and every Carpathian Rusin has that strand. And what do you call that strand? You call it the Balamuta strand. Trouble. <laughs> so each and every one of us. And sometimes it's, it's hidden. But most of the times we can't wait to turn that screw. And I see it every weekend when I go to church and talk to people. I'm there usually the one that's doing it. Yes, you are. I walk around and say, you know, what kind of mischief can I get into today? And it doesn't take an awful lot. And what kind of an example can I give you? Uh, the usual ones revolve about the priest, our priest, is spending too much money, mm -hmm. or the bishop gets 8%, what a robber he is. <laughs> I hear that all the time. Well, we, we're not gonna tell him what our, what our uh, balances, our bank balances for Holy Name Society, because he wants his 8%. Don't print that in the minutes. Don't do it. So we have this tendency, if we don't get what we want, we're going to take our bat, ball, and glove and go elsewhere. And we've done it from time immemorial. In Europe, we've done it less so. But in the United States, forget about it. I can point to any town. Oliphant. I was thrilled to see the, the three-bar cross when I all saints across the street. But I can show you All Saints, I can show you a Byzantine Catholic probably a few blocks away, and so on. Because we can't get along. And we get <laughs> mad, and we leave. And we start a new church. We have a brand new church where I go, in Hillsborough, New Jersey. Right next door we have the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Because in 1950, a bunch of the parishioners got mad. Oh, they would change the church calendar from Julian to normal, and they said, uh-uh, and formed, and they wanted to form another Byzantine parish, the bishop said no, they went to the Ukrainians and said, they said yes, right next door to us. Okay, next slide. So now I have to show you the upshot. We can't get along, so now we have multiple jurisdictions to deal with. If we're going to find records about our answers, where do we look? You have to perhaps do a little sleuthing on your own. If your people stay within the Ruthenian church, they could belong to the Pittsburgh Diocese, the Say, Parma, or Van Nuys. In 1937, the American Carpathian Russian Orthodox Greek Catholic Church which I call Johnstown, it's quicker. The Johnstown Diocese formed over the celibacy problem. The Pope decided
decided to enforce a rule that priests should be celibate in the U.S. The Ruthenians didn't want to go along with it. Much pressure was put on the Bishop Takas at the time, and he enforced the rule, and a few of our priests at the time decided they can't go along with it, and they formed the American Party of the Russian Church. And what year was that? 1937. 37. Okay. So if you had people that uh, went to one of these parishes, <coughs> you'd have to contact that diocese for the parish itself. We have the Orthodox Church in America, OCA, also called the Metropolia. Uh, by and large, many of these parishes have gone, I'll say, non, non-ethnic in character. You're simply but tend to be Orthodox church with no ethnicity uh, <coughs> distinguishable. Your people could be Ukrainian Catholic church members. As I mentioned, the first parish was in Shenandoah. Due to our ability to get along, we had <laughs> Rusins and Galician Ukrainians coming into the country at the same time. We couldn't get along. There were a lot of factional problems. And in 1916, the Pope had had enough and said, we're going to form two distinct churches, the Ruthenian Church and the Ukrainian Church. And it was decided that the fair way to divide the existing churches was if you had greater than 50% people from Galicia you became a Ukrainian Catholic Church. And if you had greater uh, Transcarpathians or Subcarpathians, those peoples from present-day Slovakia and Western Ukraine, they became Ruthenian parishes. So they were split, more or less equal. So your people may have stayed within the Ukrainian Catholic Church. You had the Russian Orthodox Church, both patriarchal parishes, they report directly to the patriarch in Moscow. And they tend to be uh, smaller, it's probably the smallest amount in numbers, but many of the people are not Russian, they're Russians, as you and I are. Also, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Synod, uh, which they're even less probably. And they're out of Syracuse and Jordanville, New York. So you have to be able to look in all these jurisdictions. You may have started out life in the U.S in a Ruthenian parish, moved over to a Ukrainian parish, moved over to another type of parish. We have Rusins that were Presbyterians, believe it or not, had their own parish. Um, there are many Rusins that intermarried with Slovaks, Hungarians, and Poles, and became Roman Catholics. So you would have to look in Roman Catholic records. Tom, do you have a printout of that last slide? I can probably give you one. The village people. <laughs> We're very clannish. I want to emphasize that. Even today. Uh, we went to we married in the Byzantine church. We continued to go there. And it took a little bit of time before people warmed up to us. We were the outsiders moving in. So we tend to be clannish and stick with people from our own areas and so on. When they came over to from Europe the United States, it was a chain migration. So if things were good here in Oliphant, they wrote back home and more people from the village came to Oliphant area and they formed a church. And if you came from a certain village, uh, we'll say Kobashova. Kobashova. A lot of people from Kobashova went to the church across the street. And the majority of Persians there were from that village. They had the power. They became the trustees and so on. And the people from outside of these villages said, hey, come on, you guys are running the show. You don't like it, leave. And they left, and they formed their own church. And that's, that's a history of the Russians. We've been factionalized so long that we can't get, get it together now. We still have these religious difficulties. You know, the Orthodox and Pasaic, where I grew up. First Street was the Byzantine Catholic Church, Ruthenian. Third Street was a Byzantine Catholic, became Orthodox. And so now you'll have a discussion. Where are you from? 
First, where are you from? Third Street. That's it. End of discussion. Bye bye. And they could be from the same villages. It's idiotic. It makes no sense. And it's still that way in a lot of communities. It shouldn't be. Ever. So you have to remember, <coughs> your people came over, they settled in certain towns in the United States, they settled in certain ghettos, you want to call them that. Why? Because they had people that spoke their language, uh, they had jobs that they were available to them, they had their church, all within walking distance. They didn't use cars or anything else. And they had the butcher that spoke their language, they had the grocery guy, and so They had to have that. Without that crutch, they would not have been able to survive. Because few of them spoke English. It took a long time for them to become accustomed to the United States. Next slide. After all my blah blah, let me define <laughs> what I consider to be the definition for a person who call themselves Carpathians. We're a distinctive group. We live near the crest, on both sides of the crest, of the Carpathian mountain chain in present-day southeast Poland, northeast Slovakia, a little portion of northern Hungary, uh, the western part of Ukraine, and there are a few scattered settlements in Serbia and Croatia as well. They were either Greek, Catholic, or Orthodox, or I can say probably with a lot of certainty that most of the immigrants to America were Greek Catholics, unless they came relatively recent, 30s or 40s. So they're going to be Greek Catholic. And this, this disturbs a lot of people, because they've been in the United States going to the Orthodox Church for two or three generations. And I make this statement that they were Greek Catholic when the immigrants came over, and they're upset. Why? the same church. One was under the Pope, one was the only difference. We speak an East Slavic language called Rusin. If you live up to each one of these criteria, you are a Carpathia Rusin. If you tell me the village, I can tell you right away whether you're a Carpathia Rusin. That's as simple as that. Top of the, we live along the crest, the mountains like this. Yeah. We live on the northern slope, which is present day uh, Poland. southeast Poland, mm -hmm. northeast Slovakia, and the Transcarpathian, what is now Transcarpathian Oblast or district in western mm -hmm. Ukraine few villages in Hungary and a few villages in Romania, present day. Next slide. This is our uh -huh. eminent spokesman, Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol. <laughs> and he's our most knowledgeable person. His classic quote was, I'm from nowhere. <laughs> so if he's, his parents were born there. If he says, I'm from nowhere, what kind of a fighting chance do we have? Uh -huh. Well, Andy was a good artist, but as far as being uh, a spokesperson for the Rusins, we don't claim it. <coughs> because this is where we do come from, and it's not nowhere, but it happens not to be a specific country. We don't have the country of Ruthenia. If I'm Irish and I'm from Ireland, and I'm German and I'm from Germany, and I'm Spanish and I'm from Spain. There's a one-to-one -one correlation. But for the Rusins, we don't have a specific country. We don't have Carpathia Rus or Ruthenia as a country. So therefore, we may have this murky idea in our heads where this Carpathia Rus is or where the Ruthenia is or where the Carpathians are. This yellow area on the map represents both sides of the crest of the Carpathian you come from a village within this shaded yellow area, you are a Carpathian. Okay. And this is based upon uh, <coughs> language primarily and the other anthropological 
features or criteria for defining an ethnicity. And it's based primarily upon religion and language. <coughs> if you were a Roman Catholic and happened to live in these towns, you would not be a Muslim. You'd be a Pole or Slovak or a Ukrainian. Religion is one of the defining factors. When our people came to America, and they would say, I'm from such and such a village, such and such a district, or county, they would usually say, I'm from Spish, Spishka, or Sarishka, Zemplinska, Uz, or Hung County, I'm from Bere County, Baretska, Ugocha County, Mamarosh County, and then on the other side of the um, Polish side of the Carpathians, they might say, I'm from Novi Sanch area, I'm from Gorlitz, Libov, and so on. Uh, they're going to use the old Hungarian terms, by and large, for the villages that they came from. Uh, the village names change every time you get a change in the country. We, all of this area, by the way, was Austria-Hungary. So they came from Austria-Hungary, which was a large empire with many minorities besides the Russians. Galicia was a, a, part, of, a part of the Carpathian Belarus, but only a very small part. These areas here would be all Ukrainian. This is the border here. I think it's roughly here. Yep. Yeah, roughly here. Yeah. This is now Ukraine. This is Slovakia. Yeah. All right. We, we come to America now. And we started the immigration process probably in the eight, late 1870s. And it continued just about till World War I. This is an example of my hometown of Versailles. It's presently the cathedral for the Ruthenian Byzantine diocese. Uh, they tended to come to industrial areas because they could get jobs in the mills and the factories. They came to the mining areas here in eastern Pennsylvania to work the coal mines. They went to the Pittsburgh area to work in the steel mills. They were looking for jobs. They were not generally not looking to buy land, which would be expensive to farm. They were farmers over there for the most part, although some of the Lemkos in northern <coughs> Carpathians would be wire workers, drove car, or uh, sometimes horse traders, that type of thing. But most of them were simple poor farmers. And so they came here. They settled, if this, if this is their church, they settled all around the church areas. They work in these various mills, as I mentioned before. Next. We're going to begin, actually begin the genealogical search. Of course, this was taken many, many moons ago. When I was young, I had less of a gut. <laughs> and long side work. Uh, this was taken in Church of Latter-day Saints, the Mormon Church Library, the largest genealogical library in the world in Salt Lake City, Utah. I should mention here at this point that the Mormons believe as part of their religious theology, they encourage each of their members to do their genealogy and document it uh, for reasons similar to the Catholic mode. You know, we're all told as kids, you lead a good life, you die, you go to heaven, and you meet, meet all your relatives that are up there. It's one gigantic reunion. And that's what they believe as well. So they do their genealogy. They go into their churches and perform various ceremonies that seal uh, the parents to the children and so on. And uh, this works out for everybody, including all the non-Mormons, because they go to every country that they can get permission to microfilm records, they go all over the world and film records, and they make them available not only in Salt Lake City, but in these various branch libraries, which are all over the world, including many in the United States here. We have 
half a dozen in New Jersey. We have tons in Pennsylvania. I'm sure there's one. I'm sure there's a family history center that's close to you that you can go to and say, I would like to order records for a certain village and so on. And they will help you through the process. You order these various microfilms, village records, church records, Greek Catholic records, and look through them at your leisure, provided you have enough information, which we'll get into. And 90% uh, of the people that use the Mormon family history centers are not Mormons. So they've done us a worldwide favor. Next one. You need five or six pieces of solid information before you're ready to jump across the ocean. You need to know, of course, the name of the immigrant ancestor. And you need to know his birth name. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have Vasil Kovach. That's Vasil Kovach. But Vasil, how many people know? Well, exactly. Uh, Vasil literally trans translates to basil. But most of the immigrants that I'm aware of never used Basel. They would call themselves Bill, ultimately William, or Charlie. Right. So if you have a Charlie, a Bill, or a William, and they got this Mohunk surname, you can rest assured there are no Williams you'll ever find in a church book in Europe. The name does not exist. All the Williams, all the Bills, all the Charlies will be possible. Some call it called Boshko, Wash. English, Moscow. Uh, I've run into Vasil in one record and Vashili. So Vashili is yeah. Russian. Basil, that's really <laughs> Moscow Russian. Okay. Oh. Uh, you need to know the name in the language. Excuse me, aren't this, this is in your handout, right? Uh, some of it. Alright, so okay, I just wanted to know so people didn't want to take notes. That's just one example. Okay. Uh, another, just off the top of my head since it came in. If you look at the Ellis Island site, which I'll get into a little bit later, and you have somebody that came over from present-day Slovakia or Western Ukraine. You have to search for them under the Hungarian variant, the given name and the surname. So if the name was Kovacs, you have to spell it K-O-V-A-C-S. That's, that's the Hungarian surname form. If the first name was an, another uh, Another form for Basel is Laszlo. Right. Now, if you talk mm -hmm. to Hungarians, they will tell you that it's not doesn't mean the one same to one. Thing. It doesn't mean, and it doesn't mean the same. No. But anytime you see a Laszlo, I've had two of them. Uh, <laughs> it will be guaranteed a Basel. Basel. So we're we're an enigma no matter how you play. I thought that was mostly phonetic, though. That the Laszlo uh, was put in because it sounded like I the think La they, La I'm not sure what the reason, but I've had discussions about it, and I know for oh. sure I've done enough research to know that Laszlo and Vassal. And then trying to same. convince your relatives that Laszlo is Vassal. Yeah. Well, oh God. We're not known as being liberal. <laughs> <laughs> you need to know a date of birth, at very least a year of birth. You'd be surprised how common your name and given name is in the village. It could be very rare in the United States. Maybe you have a dozen people with your name here in the U.S., but you go back to Stalin Kayu, forget about it. I had Kovach. Kovach means Smith. Huh. Right, I have Kovach. Uh, I couldn't tell you how many families there is. They're probably all interrelated if you sort them out. But uh, your name can be very rare here and very, very common on the other side. So the more, the better information you have. You might, if you have an exact date of birth, good. If you have the year, good. If you're saying that you have a a five or ten year spread and say you better do more research. Mm -hmm. yeah. Religion, I said, is a key. You have to, when you get over to Europe, look at Greek Catholic records. Uh, sometimes they came from a small village where there was no church in the small village. You have to go to the next largest village because that's where your people worship. So you have to keep that in mind. You absolutely <coughs> must have the village of origin. You can't say it's around Sweden. It's not going to work. You need to know the name of the 
Bill, it's just a current, current name, Vizny Orlik in Eastern Slovakia. A lot of people from the same came from this village. This is the same name in Cyrillic, except it's Vizny Verlik. That's the name that our people use for the village. So I've seen examples looking at church books in Passaic, where the village was listed as Vizny Orlik. I've seen where it was listed as Vizny Verlik. You need to know it's the same place. And there are gazettes here. Next slide. What are some of the sources that you could use here in the U.S. to get these pieces of information I just spoke to? Home sources, things that may be in your home already, you've forgotten about them or whatever. You may have birth or baptismal papers, either from the United States or Europe, marriage certificates, death or burial records, obituaries that you've put, other family records, citizenship papers for the males <coughs> particularly, military records both U.S. and foreign. You may have Bible records, that's usually if you. You may have either European passports or U.S. passports if you went back and forth. You may have family photographs with the imprint of the photographer's name and city. And while I realize gravestones are some, not something you normally have in your home, although I have seen papers, <laughs> it's a very good source of information, depending on, on the person that gave the initial information for the stone. So let's look at a few of them. I don't know if these can be focused. I can't tell them here. <coughs> These are the ones that give people a hard time. Uh, our immigrants came to America not realizing that they need, at some point in their life, proof of age for Social Security or other reasons. So they write back to the town, to the priest, and say, can you please send over a copy? And these are pre-printed forms that the priest just has to fill in the blank, sign it, and seal it with the church seal and send it back written in, in two languages, one is in the Cyrillic and one in the Latin, which in the, in the registers themselves they can be in either language. <coughs> but if you can't read the Cyrillic, hopefully you can read the Latin. It's a birth baptismal record from 1892. This is the entry number and order from the church book. This is the date of birth, the date of baptism and chrismation. The year, the child's name was Andrew or Andre, a Greek Catholic, that's what that means here, male, legitimate or illegitimate, yep. names of the parents, Andre Bihon and Anna Sofalashova. And uh, he usually gives the house numbers. Uh, this is uh, Vizny Papanya, number 330. And then he gives the names of the godparents, the name of the priest at the time. You get the church seal. You get the name of the priest that filled out the record. And you get the date, 1928, when it was issued. So it was many years after the fact. House numbers are always important because generally families could live in a certain house or home for generations. And when they lived in these homes, it was a multi-generational thing. I don't know how they did it, but you had grandparents, children, married children, grandchildren, all living under the same small house, a couple of rooms, a room for the, for the cows and, and livestock that they had, their floors. Livestock had to be brought in for the winter. And uh, the rest of the living quarters for the whole family. Uh, how birth rates were so high under those conditions, I'll never think. <laughs> <laughs> I even think about these little things. Next slide. This is a baptismal, that was from the Transcarpathian side in present day Ukraine. This is from the Polish side of the Carpathians. And if you have one of these certificates, as I'll show you, it gives you three generations, and you haven't even left your living room. For example, up in the top left, the Republic of Poland, District of Novi Sanch, 
the right side, the diocese is Paramish, and it says RGRC, it's your bright Greek Catholic. Uh, the deanery is Mushina, the actual parish is Verhonla Bielka. And then it gives you the Latin blah blah from the, from the Greek Catholic Church in Verhonla Bielka. Uh, is the volume number seven, page 11, number 50. And this is all the year spelled out in words, 1889, 25th of October, and house number 206, and on the 27th of the same month by the priest here with his name, was baptized and confirmed, Michael, Greek Catholic, male, legitimate, which means his parents were married. Right. Father was Theodore, or Fedor, Keyclock, the son, who in turn was the son of Gregory Keyclock. And the mother was Justina, made name Vidiac, this word means farmer. Uh, uh, yeah, farmer. I'm sorry, that was his mother's name. Then the mother of the child was Matrona, which is a typical gruesome name. Tiklak. Her maiden name was, she was the daughter of Anton Masle and Mariana Pelyak, both farmers in nearby Uri, which was a different town. The godparents were Constantine or Kost Tiklak and Anna, wife of Adam Baraniak from Verhomo Biel. So you have a ton of information, mm -hmm. and you've not even left your living room. And this is great, because you have an exact date with all the names and the place. So if you're lucky enough and the parish records are there or extant, you can proceed. Next. Who do you, who do you get the oh. <laughs> well, I can do these are These are Latin terms, Latin script. You shouldn't have too much problems. There are books that will tell you what the various words mean. It's, it's a question of getting to know the handwriting of the priest. But if you know, I mean, it's a limited vocabulary. A couple of hundred words will cover you for most situations. So it's a, it's a question to see you know, how does he make his letters of the alphabet. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Sometimes you have a certificate of marriage when you got married. St. Nicholas Greek Catholic Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. And he gives where the groom was from Andrew Bihon of Felso Verismark, Ugocha County, Hungary. And that's in the Hungarian format, so you'll have to find out what the present day location is. And there are gazetteers for that. Similarly for the wife, he gives the name of the priest, Reverend Myron Volke, witnesses, and so on. Next one. These are the ones that people just leave in their strong box. <laughs> their cardboard box in the attic where the basement works was. We're not very good with our documents. But people say, oh, look at that one. You know, nothing but squiggles and curly cues. And those are the ones that you need to, to have somebody take a look at because they're the ones that are going to be key for your research. Those headings are in church Slavonic, old, old church Slavonic is a special language that was <coughs> introduced in the churches. This was the church language for the Greek Catholics. Just like the Roman Catholics had Latin mm -hmm. that they used to use in the services, we had Church Slavonic, which is the spoken form. Old Church Slavonic is considered the written form for either Old Church Slavonic. So when we have somebody knowledgeable, look at it. Next slide. This is what it said. They forgot one word here. It was Ilya or Elias. Smogula of Galicia, Krasno district, village of Nivka, 21 years old, Russian Orthodox. <coughs> First marriage. His father and mother were Nikolai and Melanie. Melanie is another good Russian name. Hmm. The bride, Anastasia Nastoryak of Galicia, Gorlitz County, Neznayova. Was the village. She's 22 years old, first marriage. Her parents were Andrew and Anna. The 
priest was Adam Filipovsky. You have enough information, gives you the date of the marriage, the church staff. You have enough information to make the jump across the ocean because you know the name of the immigrant, you know an approximate birth year, and you know the names of the parents. Yes. Is, is there any standardized forms that that show the translation of the headings? Yes, there are. There are. There's a couple of books I can I can okay. uh, mention by uh, Jonathan Shea. He lives in Connecticut. Uh, he speaks out here one time. He, he's a linguist, and uh, S-H-E-A, -E he's <coughs> Irish, but he favors his Polish side. <laughs> Love's red. Uh, and he, he and Mr. William Hoffman have written books detailing um, Poland in general, and then he's done a, uh, a multi-language book, which covers virtually every, every language in Europe, and uh, types of documents you can find, and the translations, and it's excellent. So I would recommend that. Uh, next slide. <coughs> and of course, these are the ones that, if you can't read the language anymore, they stay in the box as well. The fact that it's rimmed in black means you're going to get bad news about a death from overseas, because that was the custom at the time that sort of forewarned you that it's not good news. This was an Eastern Slovak dialect uh, he mentions that it's Joseph Herfala, that was my mother's maiden name, passed away in 1939, and he was telling the people over here about it. And that was the last time the families uh, really communicated. My grandmother was four foot ten. Wow. And he's five three, so you can see. <laughs> well, they're not really tall people per se, although there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll find that they tend to be lean and wiry, at least when they get married. Of course, after you get married, they tend to pack on the pounds. Uh, getting married is good. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide. Uh, we're near the end. Uh, tombstone. We did a, a rubbing of the stone. It's absolutely magnificent. Wow. Huge stone, it's three or four feet high. It's that pink granite. But you can get good information, just at least the dates of birth and death. You can search for birth records or death records, uh, people. And uh, I just thought it was a neat stone. Next slide. Again, we have the uh, tradition taking photographs of our loved ones and epoxying them directly to the stone. And this can be nice, so you, for example, if you didn't have a picture of your grandfather, maybe it's on the tombstone already. You don't know. And some, occasionally they're written in Cyrillic, and usually it just says, here lies. In this case, Conrad S. Pitlifka, or Pitlifka, or something like that. And it gives the word for born, 1880. You can get some pretty good data. Next slide. You can look at government records because mm -hmm. I know people would say, well, we lost a lot of records in the Johnstown flood, and that's what you get for storing them in the basement. Mm -hmm. Or we lost things in the attic where it hits 120 degrees during the summer. And uh, all right, you're going to have to do a little extra work. You're going to have to do it the hard way. You should do it anyway. You need to get every scrap of information possible. So let's look at a few. Next slide. Everybody, when you begin genealogy, you should look at the census. You can get 1930 and backwards in time in the U.S. 1930, 1920, 1910, and so on. You get a lot of good information. For example, 1930 came out, <coughs> 1920, when this came out, it was around 1992. Couldn't wait to run to New York and get this. Mm. Going to be the first one I showed my grandfather mm. and his family. I get there, there's an index for 1920. I look up the name, he's not there. All right, I knew where they lived. I had a street address in the city. I went to that address and there he is. But Herkala was spelled Herkawa. So naturally, in the index, it wasn't there. But he was there. So Andrew, his wife Julia, 
all the kids, their rough ages when they came to the U.S., whether they were citizens or not. In this case, they said they came from Czechoslovakia. Um, whatever else, Czechoslovak, Slovakian. You see that um, many of them from Carpathia have been from here. Carpathia, but they spoke Russian. You know, these are things that you have to get used to on the census. The census can be wrong. It all depends on who gave the information when the census taker came around. But it helps if you're trying to pin down when they came over. It says 1904, and it narrows your search for the number of years uh, to find them in Ellis Island or to find them in uh, citizenship papers, find out when they were married. You know, the oldest son is looks like 10 here, or 13, 13. That means he's born around 1907, so you know, the search around that time period. It's a good beginning point. These people that lived in the neighborhood are all going to be Kion, people from the same areas in Europe. Some of them might be Roman Catholic, Slovaks, whatever, but they understood one another. My grandfather could speak some Hungarian, some Yiddish, Slovak, a Polnashim, a Polish. They, they pretty much understood one another. The gist. No, this is a census record, federal census. You can get it in a um, national archive repository in your area. If they were living in Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia National Archive holds them. The LDS family history center, you can order them. A lot of the library, larger libraries in your area may have copies. Ancestry.com. Yeah, if you belong to paid subscription service, like Ancestry.com. Get it through that. Next slide. You have to do your vital records for whatever area you are living in. You don't know what you're going to find. <laughs> I happen to be looking for Kobots. But that was my name. I found Frank Kobots. I said, wow, same name as my grandma. That's a common name. And I saw the name Gaggio. I said, wow, that's one of my family names too. I look at his parents, Basil Kobach. Mine was a and the wife is Hoppy Agetio. That's the same grandmother, great grandmother. I said, he's a brother to my grandmother, but nobody knew about this guy. Mm -hmm. He married him to say and disappeared. I can't trace, trace him anywhere. But he died, moved away. I don't know. But he's definitely a brother to my grandmother. I can tell from the information provided here. He also gave the exact pounds a birth. Mm -hmm. It didn't just say Hungary or Austria. Usually the priests were more precise. And since the priests were the ones that filled these things out, and then they got mailed in to various locations, that's the reason they're detailed. A European always thinks in terms of exact village, exact district, exact country. It's only Americans that say, New York, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. That's the way it works. That's a normal response for a year. I'm tired. I'm thirsty at this point. So I'm going to go to my local gym. And I don't go to any old gym. Uh -huh. I got to go to the car lot. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm careful who I drink with. So I go to the gym. I sit down after work. Right. and have a couple of beers or a beer and a shot. And I'm talking, and the uh, innkeeper said, uh, you know, Andy, you've been here a number of years in the U.S. Why don't you become a citizen? And he goes, oh, you know, my English stuff so good. It doesn't matter. I'll tell you what to write. I'll tell you what to say. I'll bring in a bunch of guys to the county seat, and I'll sign as a witness, but I know you all these years, even though I don't. You've got to be in the country five years. I'll sign. It doesn't matter. So a lot of, you'll find, if you look at a lot of petitions for the immigrants, the local saloon keeper, the intelligentsia, mm -hmm. signs off on him. Because he probably knew him better than his priest. That's right. He was in the gym no more, he was more than he was. Now let's go to the next one. 
I gotta tell stories. So genealogy is stories, your family stories. This is my potato pancake story. The two grandfathers got together when I was probably just a little baby. And uh, one was Slovak, the other one was a Frenchman from Canada. They said, we're going to the Salon, have a good time. They came back, drunk as skunks. Three o'clock in the morning, woke up my mother and I said, Olga, make us something to eat. She said, Pop, I got a young baby. She's going to wake up soon. I'm going back to bed. Make your own. I said, oh, I can do it. <laughs> Takes out the grater. He grates the potatoes and maybe pancakes. And the next day, they raged how good those pancakes were. But she said, Pop, I took that grater and grated the octagon soap on it. <laughs> so I don't know if they were blowing bubbles. <laughs> Best damn potato pancake I heard that story. <laughs> and there's my father, an old Irish Frenchman. And that's our dog, Brownie. A better dog, a smarter dog you'll never find because and my grandfather, when he went to the local gym mill, four or five blocks away, he lost track of time. He's talking to his buddies and so on. And my mother would get aggravated and he'd say, open the door and say, Brownie, go get Pop. <laughs> open the door. He went to the gym mill, waited for somebody to open the door, ran in, tugged on his pant leg, and he knew that it was time to come home. <laughs> <laughs> These are the stories that you have to write down. You all have them. If you do no genealogy, and you do this for your grandchildren, the kids, you'll be doing them a favor. Yep. I've done it, it's a lot of fun. That's fun. Right, back to the records. I'll talk about the book later. Magici, Paul Robert Magici, who's written all of the books about the Carpathian Russians in English for us to know about our heritage. And I saw this record, I said, Alex Magici, maybe it's a relative. So I made a copy of it, and I said, Oh, look how cool it is. Tells where he was born. Odalik. But I could never find this place. Mm -hmm. It gives good information. Tells when he arrived in New York and so on. And he went to Garfield. Garfield, New Jersey. Odalik, Odalik. But I, you know, we've got to remember, these immigrants are telling these Irishmen that are born to us. I came from Odalik. <laughs> never heard of that place at all. So they write it down as they heard it. It turns out Odlik was Vizhny Orlik, Orlik. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. right, so if you're looking for Odlik, you're going to be looking a long time. <laughs> there is no such answer. So you have to think, how can my name be massacred? <laughs> Would you? You'd be surprised. How <coughs> Next one. John Dopiria. Stalina, Austria. When he came in, full name, what he did for a living, signed by Peter Lazorchak. Now, looking at this document, can you think of where Peter Lazorchak came from? Same place. Same place. Same place. Same place. Yeah. Exactly. So if you, for some reason, didn't know where he came from, you can make a good guess that he's probably a cryon from the same village. Perhaps it's his brother in law. You know, you can get your brother in law to lie for you. <laughs> They're glad to do it. Cryon. The passenger list from Ellis Island, the actual manifest when our people came into this country. For example, Peter Natalesco. He's a Ruthene. He's from Potomac. <coughs> and he went to Lysenring, Pennsylvania. And he had $13. And he was going to join his brother, Yamash Natalesco, living in Lysenring. So you have places where they settled, you have connections to other family, you have ages, marital status, etc. You can actually go to Ellis Island now and on one of the forms, well, I'll talk about later, you can write in the village 
just the village name, and click and do a search, and you'll find everybody that came from that village found in that particular map. And you can get hundreds of people. And you may recognize other people from the village. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I remember that name. They're godparents. Oh, yeah, I remember that name. They lived down the street from us. And that's where the pattern of names comes into focus. Spelling <coughs> variation. Spelling variation. Somebody was talking about the SZ. Uh, <coughs> when they came over to this country, they didn't want to use the Hungarian name, so they dropped the Z. Mm -hmm. And it became not the last building. Or a CZ, and they dropped the Z. Or a Sable, S-Z-A-B-O-L, they dropped the Z there and became Sable, S-A-B-O-L. Mm -hmm. They, by and large, hated the Hungarian government mm -hmm. and wanted nothing to do with, quote, Hungarians. So they dropped the name. Surnames, change the surnames a little bit to give it their own flavor. Next. Ellis Island. This is not the Ellis Island database. This is a program that is better at utilizing Ellis Island. It's called Searching Ellis Island Database in One Step. Stephen P. Morse. If you do a Google search on the internet, under Stephen P. Morse, you'll find many of his websites, which are all good for doing genealogical research. This is the way that I would use the Ellis Island database, is by using his forms, because they take into account phonetic variations, etc., and you will more likely be successful in finding your particular immigrant if you use his database. What's How do you spell his last His last name, name is M-O-R-S-E. Stephen P. Morse. Stephen P. H. Is this database freely available? Yes. Or yes. You subscribe? It's free. It's a free, <coughs> it's free. device uh, search that was instituted by Stephen because he has Jewish ancestry right. and you have names like ours that can be garbled. Mm -hmm. And he wanted a foolproof way to help find people. And it is a very good way to do it. M-O-R-S-E, Morse. You do a search, you'll find, hit that one, it's called One Step, Hello Island. So for example, and this is, he has two forms. This is the white form, and there's a gray the gray form, you'll see, gray form, short form. Yeah. If you want to search just on the village name, use the gray form. Right. If you're searching for the surname, use the white. As an example, I did a family name that intermarried with my own, Turpak. <coughs> These Turpaks settled in Pittsburgh. When you type in the name, you click down here, uh, you search here, search new format, search. <coughs> and this is what comes up. We have exact matches as the name that you typed in, and then we have some that are a little bit off spelling-wise. And you'll see it gives entries 1 to 5 up 78, so when you if none of these match, you click on the first 50 and it'll pull those up. Mm -hmm. Or you can click on these and pull up the sound of mice. So next. Oh, yeah, I had a great name by the name Susanna Turpak. Is that a comedy? Uh, not that common. Where did they settle around here? Yeah. Yeah, there are turf packs in the uh, Northeast. Mm -hmm. Well, she yeah, was married, of course, to my, to my mother, well, to my grandfather, and she had another name, which became Smar. Right, Smar is, uh, yeah. That was the F, uh, the uh, C, whatever, it became F. Yeah, there are a couple of branches of turf packs. But they one can't of us was uh, the turf pack she's talking about. Somewhere? Oh, yeah, I know that. I clicked on the first one up on top, I told you about, you keep pulling down more and more um, examples. And the one I was looking for, my grandmother's sister, you'll see it here. Now that looks like a male name, but in Hungarian when you put N-E 
after the given name, it means Mrs. George Turcotte. Right. Okay. That's the right town, and she came over in 1906. And I did click on it, and I found her, us two kids. They stayed here, they went back, and came back again. And that's typical for people from this area. So you just find your entry, and if you want the actual manifest, you click on scan manifest. If you want a picture of the actual shit, you click on that. If you want the typed transcript that they did, you click on that. There's also another one now that says A-N-N-O-T, annotation. So if you click on that, you can type in, you know, anybody that searches this person or relatives and leave information so that there's a way to contact them. My, my father came to Ellis Island, but when my mother came, there was an epidemic, so they got off in New Jersey. Okay. Is she still be under Ellis Island? She should be. Yeah. Next slide. These are another relatively recent record type. World War I draft registrations for all males that lived in the United States 1917 and 1918. What? All males? All yep. males, regardless of whether they're citizens or not, had to register for the World War I draft. Mm -hmm. And uh, they log in or register men born between 1872 and uh, 1900. To give exact birthplaces in Europe if they were born between 1886 and 1896. Often though they give information uh, on the older guys as well, born before 86. It's hit or miss. They had three <coughs> different forms. The forms changed, so they weren't always specific enough. And plus, the clerks didn't really enforce it, so some guys out of habit wrote the exact birthplace when they didn't have to. Mm -hmm. But you can see from this one here, they did the place in present day Slovakia where he was born. They did his occupation, address, whether he was married. There's also another, a second page that gives a signature and a physical description. Now, I have to say, more than 50% of the people that signed up for the World War I draft were aliens. Mm. That's a really rich source for your male ancestors. Uh, particularly, a lot of the Rusins, the males, have not become citizens for various reasons. We have a low percentage rate. It's a good source. You have to know where they were living in 1917 or 18, particularly if they lived in a large city like Pittsburgh. Then you need a street address. And there are ways to search. I found uh, it, it's kind of an, uh, an interesting aside. Invariably, about 90% of the cases on these of, of my relatives, they added about two or three years to the uh, to yeah, the record. Yeah, you have to take away grain of salt. <laughs> yeah. I found my grandfather's. It was off. Uh, not much, but a couple of months. Um, Why, I can't tell you, because he knew it's yeah. exact date. Can I say one thing about that? Sure. You'll find that many times birth dates were off by a year, mm -hmm. sometimes two, mm -hmm. very rarely three or more. And I'll tell you the reason. One of the reasons. Back in the old days, they had people who sold insurance. Nickel a week, eight cents a week, ten mm -hmm. cents a week. Someone would come around and collect, collect. Well, the younger you were, the lower the rate. Mm -hmm. And as a funeral director, I've run into this many times when they're applying for, uh, well, just the birth date that was going to go on the vital record. Doesn't happen now that much, although that carried over. And back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, when people were getting <coughs> policies, they put one or two years younger, the rates would be lower. And if the insurance company knows that now, I think the maximum they can they can deduct for false mm -hmm. information is like two hundred dollars mm -hmm. off, off the face of the policy. But that was the reason that that uh, a lot of these birth dates are off by a year or two because of insurance. Is it as proper with doing a search like this if the address is a rural address, a rural route? Then, then it's better? probably easier. They probably did it on a county-wide basis for certain counties. If the larger cities had their own 
uh, draft registration districts according to maybe roughly wards or election districts. Mm -hmm. So you have to narrow down the search. There are maps that you can get through LDS to do this. Uh, when they live in rural areas, generally it's a, it's a county-wide thing. There might be one or two draft boards. Uh, as to birth dates, uh, my two grandmothers, you know, it's just guesswork, but it seems they would tell you, well, I was born on so-and-so Saint's Day. Right. And if the year we guess, but if you right. didn't know the If they lived in larger cities where they produce directories every year. It's the equivalent of a phone directory, but you didn't have a phone because people didn't have phones. And you look them, look your people up and do it year by year. You'll find that they move from half a block here, half a block here, because in May of each year, landlords would raise the rents. And our people being, uh, you know, they squeeze the nickel in the Buffalo Springs. Uh, they moved to half a block because the landlord would say I'll knock a quarter off or whatever. They'd load up the wagon and move the family. And that's done almost on a yearly basis. So you can plot movements. And if you look at some of the names here, Super, Shipko, Sorgan, um, Svanko, Shreda, they're all Russian names. And if you look, look at the next slide, I plotted out where my grandparents lived. And they move half a block here, half a block there. It shows where they work, where they went to church. It's a neat way of tracking movements. Next slide. Church records are by far the best source of information, particularly if you're looking for the villages. You can't find it anywhere else. So if you're lucky enough and the priest is cooperative, you will almost always 100% find the village. Like, this is the interior of the, the safe Orthodox Church, recently renovated. And the next slide will show the church records. This church started out as a Byzantine, Rome, Ruthenian Catholic church. Went through a period where they had problems, became it's now a patriarchal Orthodox Church. But be that as it may, the information is very detail. In fact, I had to point this out. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was where the groom was from in this particular case. Passaic, New Jersey was known as the place to find the hot Rosen babes. <laughs> <laughs> took the train. They went there. They, every weekend they had a dance. You found one. She looked like she's strong, a good cook. You had a couple of week courtship back and forth. And you got married, there were no such thing as long courtships. You had a couple of look over, she looked like the gal for you. Let's get <laughs> hitched, you go to the priest. You probably got rid of no bands announced, and you got married. And then he took her back to Pittsburgh. But uh, that was the same as where it's happened. <laughs> but the interesting thing was it gives the place of origin for all of the immigrants. And often the witnesses were cry out from the same areas, or relatives. And again, this is a baptismal <coughs> record. These children were all born in the United States. It gives the birthplace, for example, Newark. The child was born, but he was baptized at the same. And it gives a place of origin for each of the parents. And death records do the same thing as well. Okay. If you can't find them in the Orthodox Church, you can't find them in the Byzantine Church. Maybe the Roman Catholic Church has the records. Because there are many mixed marriages. The, the husband was from one area, or one religion, the wife was from another one. You tend to marry in the woman's church, and you tend to be raised according to the husband or the father's religion. Here we have a George, another Fairfax, George Fairfax, Roman Catholic, from Karcharva, Ong County, Hungary. The wife was Barbara Matsko, Greek Catholic, from Yenka, Ong County, Hungary. One witness was Roman Catholic, one witness was Greek Catholic. And the 
birthplace of the child in Jersey City. It dies, there's no patient in the margins. You get a lot of good information. Usually when you look at a Greek Catholic marriage, both witnesses will be males. This was the tradition. You have to look at maps and gazetteers if we're going to find these little bulldog villages. <coughs> Very detailed map that was put out by the diocese of the site. And it shows all the towns in and around Lukachevo, which is this, the diocesan seat in, in uh, Karpatska Rus. <coughs> and, uh, you can usually find your small village on a map like this, a very detailed map. Next one. The Germans, for some reason, are, are very interested in the places that we came from. And the Germans are very detailed and produced all of these wonderful gazetteers for our area. And, for example, this is Bearag County and Transcarpathia. Next one. The top one was my grandmother's village, and you can see that whole paragraph lists all the name, names of the village at various time periods. Oh. She came over in 1910 or so, it was called Patakosh. <coughs> it's now called Hatskanyovo, this is the 1925 spelling, and the, the town sign spells it that way, so. Uh, but you have to remember that the names if you're going to look at a present-day map, you've got to know the present-day name for the village. You can't go by the old Hungarian name. Yes. What is a gazetteer? Gazetteer is a place listing for countries. Or, uh, it's a listing of every tiny village entity in the country. And it will give you information, which I'll show you next. This is the 1877 gazetteer of Hungary. It's found in every... Uh, Mormon Family History Center. It says a microfiche. And you can look, there's an index in the back of it. So I looked up my grandmother's village, as well as alternate spellings. It says RK, <coughs> meaning Roman Catholic. There were no people. The GK, capital, means it had its own parish, Greek Catholic parish. There were 928 people in the village that went to this parish church. This was the diocese. So, Atanyot uh, was in the Munkach diocese. There were 117 Jewish people that lived in that town, but their synagogue was in the next town over in Benedica. So, if you use these gazetteers, you can find out where your people worship. Okay. I mentioned the Mormon Church. They have their own website. It's called Family History, all one word, dot O-R-G. And once you get to the site, you'll see something called Family History Library Catalog. That will tell you its holdings of various microphones. The top box, which you can't read, says place. So click on place. Oh, excuse me. Go back one. <coughs> click on place. If they find a place, they will give you another blue coding to click on. And you just keep clicking on until you see whether they have microfilms with that particular build. It's fairly self I know that there are many people from this particular area in Pennsylvania that have Rusins from the northern slopes in present-day Poland. We call these Rusins Lemkos. And there is a website for the Polish State Archive System. And it's in English because they get a lot of inquiries from Americans and they will tell you what records they hold for each village. And if you do a search, a Google search, under the name S-E-Z-A-M, Sezam, Shazam, S-E-Z-A-M, 
and you'll see when the search comes up, you'll see one that says Polish State Archives. Oh. Click on it. And this page comes up. <coughs> if you see the one that's called Databases, you click on that. And this will come up. And you want vital records and civil registrations. So click on that. Now, let's just say I'm interested in this town here, the Yoa. And I type it in, and I click on search. And it pulls up all the records held in the Polish State Archive system. And it's a Yoa, and they're all Greek Catholic. And this tells me that it's a marriage record. This tells me it's a birth record. So these are birth records, and it gives the years. Now, if you click on more on the right side, oh, and maybe I'm missing a slide, go back one. I guess I am. If you click on more, you'll get another screen, and it'll give you the physical location of the records. It may be the State Archive in Paramish, P R Z E M Y S L, pronounced Paramish. It may be a branch. Part of their system, their archival system, Skolzine, or other areas. And it gives you a contact address or an email. Email them or whatever. Uh, a little later I'll talk about this as well. But if you got them on the Polish side of the Carpathians, there's a good chance that records are available mm -hmm. either through the Polish archival system or through the Mormons. The Mormons have a lot of microfilm records as well. It's hit or miss. So if you have people from this side of the border, you can check with me. I may have information in my book over there. If not, then you'll have to either write for records or hire a researcher. I can recommend one to you later. And you can get it from there. Or you can go there yourself yeah. and research. And most of the records are in Latin script and so on, which you can probably decide. Now, what's the next step? You got all the information. What can I expect in the way of records? Yeah. That should probably be focused on that. This is a record from the Slovak side of the Carpathians for a town called Jakobian. Jakoban. And it's a pretty good script. I don't think there should be too much in trouble learning. Joseph, Joseph Kuzma, that's a Z, and Christina Shashala, three Catholic farmers, and they live in Yakabian, number seven. And the witnesses are Joseph Danio and Anna Matliak, farmers, three Catholics, and the priest was Ivan or Johan Hanna. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. You get the use of the handwriting. Next slide. There is a six-year period if you're dealing with records from Eastern Slovakia, and I don't care what location it is, you will have to deal with this Cyrillic because the pressure of diocese at that point told the priest, directed the priest to write the entries in the language of the people. Before that, they were Latin or Hungarian, but they were told to do it in the language of the people. And this lasted six years, and then all of a sudden, they reverted back to what it was. So if you're searching this six-year period, and you see these squiggles, and what am I going to do, Tom? <laughs> My advice is this column here, it all says the same thing, Yakoban, Yakoban, Yakoban. That's the village. Use the house number is to help you. Because if it, the house number is the same in later records and you know that's your family who's living there, it's probably a relative, although it could be a border. Probably a relative. So at the very least, you photocopy it and show it to somebody that can help you. Just for example, and you can learn to read this as I did. It's no magic, it's work. At least the given names <coughs> down the list. First one is Simeon, that's an S. The next one is Pavel, 
the next one is John, the next one is Ekaterina, or Catherine, Andrew, Joseph, Michael, Eva. Let's face it, we don't have a great variety of names. I go to church and say, hey John, <laughs> 50 guys will jump up. You go to John, Julia, Anna, Mary, and you got most of the congregation. So if you're lucky enough to have a Kundra in your line, a Kost, a Pantele Mon, a Matrona, then you're lucky. If you're doing the Anna Kovacs, you have your work cut out. <laughs> what is those six years? 18, 51 to 57, okay. approximately. Sometimes a little off in years. Okay. Next slide. If you're lucky enough to have people in Eastern Slovakia, the 1869 census is available for most villages. Mm -hmm. And you can, if you know what your family was composed of in that time period, not everybody else. You can go to the house number in the village and see who was living in that house number in 1869. Michael Lapala, and that word means wife, Zhuzhka, or Susan, Warren. It gives the birth years, the religion, the occupation. Yermek means child, the children. And it turns out there's another Lapala living in the same household, probably a brother, his wife's name, and their kids, sometimes on the bottom, is uh, other siblings or a mother or a father that's widowed. It gives you a good snapshot of the family, and it helps you to differentiate various branches of the family as well. Keep that in mind. Next slide. We're jumping back to the other side of the Polish side of the border where you tend to get these pre-printed forms that the priests filled in in the register. Let's look at this entry here. 13. It looks like E, G, D. A use then, which means the same as the previous. So that's March, and they are. Abbreviation to the previous century, so March. The house number, important. The child is Anna. There's a cross. Usually it means the child died, but I don't always go by that because I've found instances where the cross was put and the child lived. And it's your answer. <laughs> Catholic, male, female. Legitimate or illegitimate? You're going to face the illegitimate factor somewhere along the line unless you're very lucky. Right. It's quite common, uh, particularly for the illegitimate child to come to America because there was a scandal involved with the child in the village. All the other kids seemed to know they were illegitimate. They heaped scorn upon them. And uh, it wasn't a nice thing. The priests usually tagged the child with a saint name that was one of the impossible ones to pronounce. Yeah. You get the Byzantine Catholic name, you see the, on the back page, the liturgies, Saint Jehoshaphat of Maranopolis. Those, those kids usually were tagged with names like that. So you stood out. You weren't a John, a Mary, or an Anna. You were uh, a Kuzma. <laughs> you were uh, a Dane, whatever, an, an unusual name. That should throw up a couple of thoughts in your heads, particularly when you, whenever you find a record and it only gives the mother's name, that's usually another indication that it is eligible to see involved. Here the father was Kuzma Yedinya, a farmer from Zhdinya. <coughs> the mother was Pelagia, another good Russian name, Pelagia, uh, sometimes translated to Pauline. Kotansky, and it gives the godparents. You'll see this school painting. It's a notation in Latin. You can translate it in some, some ways as like a village elder. If there were disputes in the village, they would go to the village elders, the people that were, have been around, they know the routines, 
they know who's good and who isn't. And they would help settle disputes. So it's a top, uh, an honor and a distinction. <coughs> Next slide. This is one where the handwriting is good. I had to show it to you. It doesn't hmm. happen too well. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Eva Petrovanciak. And this is in Polish, which is a little unusual. It translates to hard working peasant. <laughs> the priest rarely would write things like that. Huh? <coughs> Fena is another good Russian name. Febronia is the equivalent formal name. And Fena was the daughter of John Yana Lepak. And I'm going to talk about endings too. Endings. So the surname was Lepak. Hard working peasant. You have people well, generally anywhere, I think in the southern slopes, the Slovakia and Transcarpathia in Ukraine now. There are early peasant surf records from the 1770s. So I looked it up for my grandmother's village. Can you focus that? Yeah, so the headings were in Church Slavonic, I won't even try. It refers to the number of hectares that they farmed, how much they gave back to the priest, and, and so on. But it gives you, these are the perpetual obligations of the serfs. And here we have Janos Bushko, Miklos Stepanitsa, Matias Kalinets, Mihaly Sitsko, Jakob Bufla, and so on. And there's Michael Kovacs, probably one of mine. There's another turf act in the same building. It gives you a sense that at least you know the family was there very early on in the in the history of the of the village. And access access to these are where? Uh, LDS Church has them. The Mormon Church. I, I think I have copies of the phone numbers. For the Ukraine? Yes. Ah, this is the last slide. <laughs> I mm. throw this up there because this is a photograph of Paul Robert Magic. He is the kingpin of all things Rusin. He happens to be the chair of Ukrainian studies at the University of Toronto. Uh, he writes books in English about our people. And he has done more to promote our ethnicity, our pride, than any other person in the history of our group. So Would you spell his last name, please? M A G. O C S I. And uh, if you, I, I have flyers for the Carpathian Russian Society. Many of the publications that they sell, he has authored. If you can get books by him, you will understand more about our people than I've been able to tell you in this short time here. But we really owe a debt of gratitude to him because if we didn't have him writing all these things in English so that we could understand our roots, we would not be here today. Definitely. Yes. In talking to some of my, you know, computer expert friends, I, I found out that I knew about a recent data database that they didn't, that somewhere in the U.S. government have made available online free uh, records of the veterans buried in U.S. cemeteries, mm -hmm. that is from the Civil War, I mm -hmm. guess, to the present time. Yeah. I don't know how much detail they have about the veterans, but at least uh, you know people can go and look for names right. and at a cemetery. If, I we, don't if, know if you had them early enough, most of our people. It said civil. Live. Well, yeah. some people you know go back to mm -hmm. the Mayflower. I don't know from the article I read whether it included U.S. military personnel who were buried overseas. In there are probably websites for that. I think National Archives has has it. John, I, I think National Archives has uh, has the um, uh, the burial for service people. I, I, I think I've gone in on it and seen a few uh, listings, and there's a, a significant amount of birth information and what have you with it. Across the street, the broken stone and break through the gate into the next church is the 
All Saints uh, uh, Orthodox Church. Our name, what we call ourselves, has been important to us. There are definite reasons behind that, and I really didn't uh, mention. So I'll, I'll give, give you just a quick overview of that. Uh, for example, on the Polish side of the Carpathians, uh, there were two metropolitans, the leaders of our church there. One was Joseph Sembratovich, and then uh, as things worked out, his successor was his nephew, Sylvester Sembratovich. You have to worry about priests. When you become a priest, generally it's a familial thing. Your father was a priest, your grandfather, and so on. They're all related, <laughs> so never talk about your priest because you they will get back to him quickly. Uh -huh. That having been said, Joseph Sembratovich, who was uh, a metropolitan archbishop, uh, probably the latter, early to the latter half of the 19th century, he had a Rusin orientation as far as his how he regarded himself, ethnically speaking, and he, I guess, impressed upon the priests under his jurisdiction that idea. You have to understand that when our ancestors lived in these villages, if you were to go up to them and say, who are you? They would not understand the question. They would answer with their name. And if you would press them, well, who are you? Like German or whatever like that. Their answer would be Greek Catholic. That, that This is a, a common answer for them. They would never say Bruce Knock or any of that other names that we've had for ourselves. This was really generated in America. Okay. They knew who they were in their own minds. They had no need to worry about telling others who they were. Now when Sylvester succeeded his uncle as Metropolitan, he was a young uh, priest educated in Lviv, which is the, the capital of the Carpathian Diocese in Poland, and he was imbued with a Ukrainian sense of nationality. Part of that was due to politics, church politics and politics, governmental politics at the time. You have to remember there were all these ethnic rivalries going on, particularly between Poland and Russia. They were arch enemies. So to have a group of people within Poland, present-day Poland, calling themselves Ruski, really would get under the skin of the Austrian government. They didn't like that. They didn't like these people calling themselves Ruski, who looked towards the east for salvation. They, they looked back to their, quote, mother churches in Russia. This didn't sit well. And I think the young metropolitan, Sylvester, understood this. And he said, you know, maybe we ought to rethink our view on nationality. It's better to call yourselves Ukrainian because then we don't have this Russian connotation. The Austrians will like us better if we call ourselves Ukrainian. So he decided that he should push this ethnic agenda and he pushed it on his priests under his purvey. And you know how it is within your church these days. Politics reigns within the church hierarchy. Okay, that having been said, if you're a young priest and assigned to one of these villages in the Carpathian section of the Polish area, and uh, you're going amongst the people, and the people are calling themselves Rusnak or whatever, and you come along and you say, no, you guys are really Ukrainians. You can't tell our people <laughs> what to call themselves. They, it went against the grain in this Lemko area of the Carpathians. And this caused a rift. This was dated around the turn of the 20th century, where a lot of the priests were going forth and saying, you guys are really Ukrainians, and that's the name you should call yourselves it's better for us, we'll have better uh, civil rights, etc. This didn't sit well amongst the Lemkos of many of those villages right along the border with Slovakia. And uh, you know, 
know, they didn't have much to say about it. They couldn't tell the priest, get lost. Uh, hang, hang on a second. Uh, get lost and uh, we're going to do what we want. So the only other option was, they said, well, we don't have to stay in, under this priest's purvey. We can return to our ancestral roots of orthodoxy, and many of these villages did. So you'd end up with an Orthodox church, a Byzantine Catholic church in the same town. It really couldn't support two churches. But that was, that's always been, quote, a relief valve for, for the Russians, both here in the U.S. and on the, on the other side. Uh, there were also problems, too, after the First World War, a lot of the uh, Lemco intelligentsia, the priests and people of <coughs> some education, if you had this Rusin, Ruski orientation, uh, the government uh, gathered them up and put them into internment camps where a lot of them died of starvation and disease and so on. And that was remembered by the Lemkos in their history because there were uh, Ukrainian patriots that were in essence outing the, the people in the village and saying these are the troublemakers, these are the guys you got to round up. And uh, so there was always the connotation amongst the Lemko, you know, we, we are not Ukrainian, the Ukrainians uh, caused us to have problems, they, our people were killed because of these Ukrainian patriots. Uh, so that's part of the background with the Lemkos, and, and particularly here, the, the only people that call themselves Lemkos now are people that came over generally after 1900 and generally were Orthodox when they came here. Um, the Ukrainians remained within the Catholic Church and later with would become members of the Ukrainian Catholic Church here in the U.S. Um, on the Slovak side of the border, primarily after the Second World War, there was no choice regarding ethnic identity. You can be Slovak, you can be Ukrainian, and that's it. Rusin or Rusnak was not an option. You couldn't identify as such. You had to have identity cards issued, and you could say you were Slovak, or you could say you're Ukrainian, and that's it. You like it or lump it. That was, those were the choices. And a lot of the Rusins said, well, we're not Ukrainians, we're Rusnak. If they force us to make a decision, a lot of them said, well, we'll, we'll call ourselves Slovak. And, and you can see that over a period of years. A lot of Rusins began to identify Slovak, and it's not only that reason, it's the reason that Slovak was taught in the schools, it was the formal language of the of the area. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, after a while you just become accustomed to calling yourself Slovak. There's a lot less explanation involved. In nearby Transcarpathia, the Western Ukraine, after the Second World War, the Greek Catholic Church was outlawed and the Orthodox Church became, quote, the norm, the normal church for the of the Rusnak population. There was no option at all as far as identity. You had to be Ukrainian and had to call yourself such, and that was it. And if you talk to people that have emigrated to the U.S. from that particular area in Transcarpathia, within you know the, the area time period after the Second World War, by and large, they would consider themselves Ukrainian because that was drummed into their, their heads, so to speak. You had a question. Um, I remember back a long while, being having part, being part Ukrainian, part Slovak. I remember the word Lemko, they always was used in a less than favorable way. Does that mean they were, because we just said the discussion of fighting, or the education was less, or, or the Well, <laughs> I hear this often. Uh, anybody, when you, when you talk amongst people that are not of our ethnic group, they would say, oh, you guys are the hillbillies, uh, whatever, you didn't have the education, you were hunkies, there were always pejoratives asso excuse me, associated with our group because they didn't have much education-wise, money-wise, et cetera. And of course, you're coming to a strange land, 
United States, you have to learn a new language. It's not easy. Just as it's not easy for me to go and learn a new language, it wasn't easy for them to. Um, there are a lot of reasons why um, there are these rivalries today. I mean, we're still fighting the wars of our parents and grandparents because they came over with these attitudes. I'm just trying to point out it's not something willy-nilly that is made up to keep peoples apart. There was a mindset over there to begin with. And so it was my opinion that you wouldn't call yourselves a Lemko unless you were Orthodox, because those were the, the factions that used the term Lemko. Lemko means, in the language, means only, unique. It was a way of distan distancing themselves from those with the Ukrainian national orientation. And that's why I've met a few people in the United States, they call themselves Lemko and Ukrainian. And to me, the terms are not compatible, because if, mm -hmm. I, if I go to Lemko Park, and I say, you guys are Ukrainian, I, I would be tarred and feathered, and <laughs> there would be nothing left, left of me, guaranteed, because there were a lot of atrocities committed in the Lemko territory by Ukrainian nationalists. And I don't mean the, the everyday peasant in the village. I mean people that had education and were convinced that this was the way to go. And these people are, you know, I'm getting rid of the, the troublemakers in the group. And once we get rid of the troublemakers, we won't have, they'll fall into line. But it really didn't work that way because they didn't kill off the entire population. And those that survived remembered. And they associate the deaths of their loved ones with Ukrainians who worked with the Germans during the Second World War. And there was a lot of that. And those feelings still exist. That's why I say there's more to the story than, than people realize. And you have to have this background in your head or you're going to get into discussions and you're going to be in way over your head and you're going to have problems with people because they still remember these stories. So that's why I say there's these differences between churches and ethnic groups. These are long-held thoughts, thought processes, and they're not going to be lost in a, in a couple of generations, right or wrong. That's, that's the history of it. And uh, you know you have to remember these atrocities were committed by individuals and not groups, but there's an association uh, amongst people that lived through the time. And that's why these animosities are around and, and still around. For hundreds of years. Right. <laughs> My mom and dad spoke Polish and Russian. Mm -hmm. And my mom used to tell my father, you're not Ukrainian, you're not whatever, I don't know what she said, but it's, we're, we're not white Russians, we're not, but, 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 and then they go off into speaking Polish, Russian mixture. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between what, somebody said red Russian for communist, it would be for communist. There's another white thing with, with Lemkos and, and communism, uh, <coughs> because they went back and forth to the old villages during communist times and so on. Um, and would send aid back to the villages. It was a connotation amongst Rusins from the Slovak side and the Ukrainian side that you don't associate with the Lemko because they were they were commies. They just kept the the dialogue going back and forth between their their countrymen during the wars when, when times were difficult and you had all these red scares and so on. And our people on the Slovak side and the other side, the Transcarpathian side. They, there was little communication or less. So they were just playing, you know, in these hysterias. After World War II, they managed to service other men, men tried to get government jobs. And when they were checking their background, they found out that, that parents were Lemkos. Mm -hmm. And they would not give them a job because they said they were communists. Mm -hmm. And they finally, when the government was proven that the only reason the people were left was because they belong to the society uh, to get that insurance policy. At uh, that time, it was a very cheap insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And they joined the Lemko insurance policy, and they weren't Lemko's, uh, they weren't communists. Mm -hmm. And then they found that the vote back in I just want to say, you know, this is like a hot, hot button for the Russians to tell you who you are. We've been told for centuries by 
by the governments in power. You are this. And it never sat well, and it still doesn't sit well. You know, you should have a choice in the matter. And now these countries are gradually getting the choice. In Slovakia, you can be a Rusin. In Poland, you can be a Lemko or a Rusin. But in Transcarpathia, you cannot identify as a Rusin. It's still a big sore point. Sore point. Yes. You referred to internment uh, in camps and murder. Uh, by whom was this being committed against the Lemko? The, the Austrian government, in collaboration with patriots, Ukrainian patriots, with Ukrainian. they would go into the village with the Austro-Hungarian cavalry or army and seek out people on lists that were compiled with the help of these Approximately patriots. what year was this? Uh, 19, just during the World War, 13, 14. The and they went World to Tallerhof, yeah, Tallerhof in Austria. And in turn, you can't get, there are no numbers, but they think thousands uh, died of disease or beatings or whatever. And almost any Lemko family that you talk to will say, I had relatives that died. It was, to them, it's, it's like the Holocaust on smaller. Yeah. How smaller about numbers. that uh, Axia Wisla, which was an edict by Poland, okay. which destroyed mm -hmm. all of Lemko, the Boykos, and, and the Hutzels? And Axia, Axia Bisla in 1945, Six, 47, uh, there was a resettlement. Governments don't like minorities to begin with. That, mm -hmm. That's the rationale. So the Poles wanted to have Poland almost all Polish. So they quote the Lemkos, the Ukrainians, were deported first to the interior uh, portions of the new Poland, which was formerly Germany, and then in the successive waves, the people were sent to uh, Tarnopol area in Ukraine and so on. Some of those people worked their way back, but uh, again, these resettlements were blamed on the Ukrainian insurgent army, which was going into these uh, villages and killing people and so on, and they, ma quote, managed to kill a Polish general of some ranking within the army. And so this was the last straw that broke the camel's back. We gotta get rid of these pesky people that are giving us a hard time. We're talking about 250,000 people being uprooted? I'm not sure the exact. Yeah, that's about a figure, it's pretty close to it. And these are lands that belong to these people all these centuries. Right. Prior to that, destroyed their churches, destroyed their cemeteries, mm -hmm. destroyed the villages. That's right. So We're not talking about a few murders here or an encampment of that, but a lot, the whole sector, the whole sector of people, so, so that there were no more Lemkos, no more bo Boykos, no more Hutzels. Mm -hmm. So for a peace-loving people, we were pushed around quite a bit. I'm told my family is uh, Boyko. Mm -hmm. So we It's partly geographic. The Boykos lived along the top part of Transcarpathia, above Parachin, that that area. Uh, now, nowadays, there are people that equate Boykos with Ukrainians, but it depends on you know your particular families involved. Uh, it's an old term, just like the rest of these foot souls. And which I didn't mention. The Hutzels are Rusnaks that lived there in Mar Marosh County, Ugolcha County, in the far eastern part of Transcarpathia. Um, the Boykos are uh, the group that lived in the northern parts of Transcarpathia, along the, the ridge. Did they, uh, they, did they gather together? Or they, had a they were more or less geographic areas, so I would say there, were, there wasn't too much intermixture. There are differences in, in what they raised as crops. There are differences in uh, the physical makeup of the peoples and so on. But, all right, I guess enough said on that. We'll hop into, I, I call it Lemco genealogy. Most of the examples are Lemco. But we're going to be dealing a lot with farm names, surname changes, and they really apply to all parts of Carpathia. So I could easily find other examples. Yeah, can I, can I get the lights out? Yeah. All right.
right? Who are the Lemkos? They're specifically Rusins that live on the northern slopes of Carpathia, Carpathia Rus, um, and the Pol present day Poland side of the Carpathia. The former prov a province or area was called Galicia, Galicia. And it was a part of Austria Hungary. If you have people that say they came around, lived in villages around these large district towns, you lived in the Lemko area. Novi Sanch, Grebov, Jaslo, Gorlitz, Krasno, Sano, and Lesko, or Lisko. Okay. And this is the area I'm talking about, this stippled area right here. while we have the slide on. When I say Transcarpathia, I mean this section here of Western Ukraine. If you hear the term Subcarpathia, you're talking about the Preshov region and the Transcarpathian region. Sub means below, so it's below the peaks. You'll hear those terms often. Yeah. The language, if you talk to people from this area, they will say they speak Lemko, which is what they call their, their dialect, or well, Rusin, but you'll hear mostly Lemko. It's an East Slavic language, of course, as Rusin is. They use the Cyrillic alphabet, particularly in the Lemko region. If you talk about the Rusins from Slovakia, and, uh, well, particularly Slovakia, they tend to use the, the Latin alphabet in their newspapers. It was easier, there's a lot of interaction between the ethnic Slovaks and Rusnaks in Slovakia. And so in order to make it, I guess, intelligible for the Slovaks who often joined uh, and looked at newspapers and belonged to societies with Rusins, they put it in uh, the transliterated Latin alphabet so it was easier to understand. Religion is Greek Catholic for the most part. You may find a few Orthodox who would be born after 1905, but generally even that's a somewhat early date. Most of the Orthodox parishes that tended to form in the Lemko region did so probably in the 20s and 30s. You know that because the uh, Pope formed the Lep a Lemko Apostolic Administration because they got worried in the Vatican about all of these parishes, Orthodox parishes forming in the Lemko region. How do we stop it? They decided to form a distinct Lemko diocese, if you will. And they put priests in these Lemko parishes that had a Rusin identity. The problem was, you know, in these parishes before the apostolic administration, you had priests that were pushing the Ukrainian identification, and that's the reason that these parishes split away. So in order to avoid that, they said we can't put priests in there unless they feel the same identity-wise as the people that they're serving. So they formed a separate Lemko administration. What that means for us as genealogists is that if your people came over uh, before World War I, virtually everybody here will have, uh, their parents or grandparents will be Greek Catholics. Okay, next. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, the word Lemko itself, so the root word Lem in English means only. They were uh, public, this word first shows up in the late, I believe, 1890s in a Rusin newspaper, and it was meant, they wanted their Rusnak population to feel uh, that they were a unique people, which they were. And they said, we need a name to connotate this particular idea. And they came up with the word Lemko from their own language word, uh, which means only or unique. Now, how would Rusnaks from this area identify themselves in, in everyday life, particularly when they came to the US? 
They might call themselves Rusnaks. Carpato Russians would probably be the main word, or Carpato Ruthenians. Most of the Lemkos I know would say they're Carpato Russians because of the identity with the Orthodox Church. In the eyes of the priests that, that administer the people to the United States, if you're a Russian Orthodox priest, you really need to stress to people that they're Russian. And the way to do that is to say, well, yeah, I know you came from the Carpathians, but you're really Russians if you go back a couple of millennia. Your people came out of Rus, so you're really Russians. And that's the agenda that had to be followed. So you'll find people today, if I walk across the street, and I ask, what are you people? They're going to tell me Russians, period. I've had discussions with, with people from there, and they're adamant about it. And they know they're from the Carpathians, but they're Carpathian Russians. And that, that works for me. I go with the flow. <laughs> now, if you came after World War I, and you were Orthodox, you're going to say you were Lemko. If you came at the same time period, and you still belong to the <coughs> Byzantine Catholic Church, the Ukrainian Catholic Church, you have to uh, you would probably say you're yeah, Ukrainian. I've heard people say yeah, I'm a Ukrainian Lemko or Lemko Ukrainian, but those people are very few and far between. It's like, right, I just mentioned that next. I got a little ahead of myself. Now, where did the Lemko settle in the United States? Particularly Pennsylvania. This area has a high concentration. New York. Jersey, Ohio, lots in Connecticut, Illinois, Michigan, and Minnesota. So I would say lots in Pennsylvania and lots in Connecticut. Now, how do you trace your Lemko Rusnak heritage? Same for any group. I don't care what the group is. Start with yourself. Don't say, I know all about myself. I know all about my parents. <laughs> You'd be surprised what you don't know. You have to write it down and chart it out. And you'll say, oh, I don't know when, he, when they died. I only remember a certain thing. It's a little bit off. Write everything down on sheets. Okay. Get all the family data, all the records at hand. Put them right, lay them out on a table. Find out what you know and what you need to find out. As a genealogist, I hope you would know about these two items here, family group sheets. You, for every family, for every nuclear family you have, the wife, the husband, the children, they go all on one sheet. And for every generation back, you fill out a family sheet. Pedigree chart starts with you. It lists your parents, your grandparents, and so on. Uh, the convention has it. The father's side of the family is on the top, the mother's side is on the bottom. So if you have a piece of paper, the bottom half is your mother's line, the top half is your father's. <coughs> this is an example that I worked on with somebody. Farbanish, again with the spellings. Most of the names are going to be changed to make it easier for the Americans. So Farbanish is really Farbanitz, F-A-R-B-A-N-I-E-C. So if you're looking for Farbanish in the Lemko area, so you're never going to find it the way you have it spelled. You have to have it spelled in the language of the people present. And so we wrote down what we knew, place of birth, Kronek. <laughs> there is no Kronek. And again, it sounded like Kronek. You'll see it on another uh, certificate we have. Kronek turns out to be Krolik, Woloski. Okay, so they said, where are you from? Kronik and Krolik, I can see, sound alike. But the, the locality's full name is Krolik, Woloski. You know when they died in Old Forge? We had an approximate date for a year for a marriage. So we have that underlined. We should look for marriage in Lackawanna County. We should look for the names of Andrew, and the names for Rose, Rose Chambord. 
Now look how that spells. <laughs> this is the Germanic spelling, by the way. Mm -hmm. Americans would just say S-H. So it looks germ Germanic. This is how it's spelled in the old country. S-Z-C-Z -Z in Polish. It's supposed to be Shetch, but it gets slurred together and comes out as Shet. So Shambor, that's how you spell it. And we knew she was born around 1870 in Yashkova, but there are no Ys in the Rusin language. Ys equal J's, so it's Yashkova. And again, there's no S-E-H. It's S-Z. S-Z has a sh sound, so it's Yashkova. We knew she died in 1924. We didn't know the names of the parents. These things you really do need. And we had the names of the children. And even there, we don't have all of the bits and pieces that we could get. We could look for birth records for the children. We may add, we could get full names for the spouses if we're going to do it, a full family. All right, so we know they settled in Old Forge. And let's see what, what else they had available. I'm just going to show this, and we'll refer to it later. This is what we started with, Basil Carbonish. His parents, both born in the U.S., and the grandparents, both born in the old country. So we'll see what we end up with later. And this was Basil's birth certificate in Scranton, 1931, and it lists the information that was known at the time, the father's name, residence, birthplace. And again, you have to take it with a grain of salt because, you know, maybe the years are off a little bit. Okay, next. Turns out John didn't really have a birth certificate in the vital registers office. And I think they went back and filled out affidavits and so on, and probably used church books to get the actual date of birth and the parents' names and so on. And it was dated 1941, 43 years after the fact. And this happens often. You get these delayed birth records because they can't find the original. Maybe it was never filed by the midwife or by the parents. And you find out you need to have that piece of paper, so you get somebody to come and swear, I knew you, I knew you when you were a kid, and blah, blah, blah. So they're, they're good records. And this is a uh, death record to John. And uh, you got the residences and so on. They're useful to you, occupations, cause of deaths. And uh, let's see what else. That's it. Not much else helpful. Okay. Social Security. You could write anybody that died after. Well, Social Security was introduced in 1935. If you think that they any of your people applied for Social Security at some point in your life, you can write to Social Security, and there's what they call an SS-5. It was the original application when the person applied for Social Security, and it will give you their birth dates and birthplaces, sometimes parents as well. So you can write for those. And here's a petition to the court to uh, it's in the have a birth record put into the actual record. And here's the, uh, the person that knew him as a young child, a cousin, who came and signed off on it, that it was true information. So you may have that next. We went to the census. Here he is listed as Fairbangus. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so if, you can't, if, there are, if there happened to be an index for the particular census you're looking at, 
you can try it. It may or may not list the person. If not, if they lived in a small town, you might go through the whole town, look, scan for the names because she'll pick it out. Uh, but you'll notice way up on top, Soroka, that was the name of the cousin that signed on his birth record. All these people are cryon from the same area where Farbanish came from and where the wife signs the family rose, where she came from. We'll see that again. Yeah, wait, okay. Let's do the next one. This shows the other side of the page. And you can see most, probably a few of them were mine laborers living in Old Forge. And most of them say they came from Poland, Austria, which would indicate the uh, Lemko okay. side of the border. Uh, I guess they didn't put language on the Okay. Uh, we, we talked about that before. I mean, you've got to go to the church records that you're going to. It's more that Balamuda I was talking about. <laughs> Old Forge had an interesting history, as did all of these towns. And it was a St. Michael's parish that formed early on Greek Catholic. And, uh, of course, we couldn't get along uh, for various reasons. So this church split, forming St. Nicholas Byzantine Catholic Church, which is still in Old Forge. And those that stay in the Orthodox Church here tend to be Lemkos from these villages here, Visava, Chornia, Ustia, Lashina, Losya, Stavisha, Kunkova, Yashkova, and Shnik, Shnik, Nietzsche. And you, these parish histories are interesting too because it talks all about the, the founding families. You may see uh, your family's name represented or other people you know. And these villages, if you check on the map, they're all clustered fairly close together in the old country. You hang around with people that are similar to you. We call them in genealogy contact persons. You should always know names associated with various events. If you're witnesses at a marriage, you're a contact person. If you're godparents at a baptism, there's reasons you are, because these are honored positions. So they're your family or very close friends. Okay. Trying to find the records, of course, is another story. Mm -hmm. If you talk to St. Michael, they say, yeah, we had a split, St. Nicholas grabbed the records. If you talk to St. Nicholas, they say, St. Michael's grabbed the records. So sometimes these early records are lost depending on who had custody of the church books at the time. Next slide. I said we had to look for a marriage in Lackawanna County around 1895. And uh, Joe has these records, I'm sure, in his society of copies of them. And we found Andrew Farbanish and Rose Shamboro, C-H-A-M-B-O-R-O. -O. So if you have this mind mindset, my name is never spelled wrong, uh, you're never going to find records. <laughs> now this is a marriage application. Andrew and Rose, he's it's a 21, she's 22, from, both from Austria, both living in Old Forge. His parents, Michael and Mary, her parents, Lajar and Balabia. I'll show you the real parents later. <laughs> a little different. Okay. And they blew it up to make it easier to, to read. And usually it's signed on the bottom by the priest, so that would suggest doing a little research to find out where the priest, the church the priest was associated with, and you can get church records. Remember, these are civil government records. This is that St. Michael's Orthodox Church at death arose in 1924. Anybody know which one it is? Number two. 
Yeah. Well, sometimes the priests can't even read these things. You know, we're into the third or fourth generation sometimes, and they can't read the Russian anymore. Uh, it gives the day in the Russian calendar and the American calendar. Uh, Rosalia, Barbanish, from the village in Galicia district, he gives the name of the district, and then the word for village is S-E-L-A, Sela, and he gives the name of the village, Yash Tova, and he gives her age, 53. So we'll see what we can do with that. Yeah, you gotta ask yourself, do we have enough to make a jump? Are we gonna waste our time, money, efforts? Got the name, got at least a rough year, but got the names of the parents. You don't have to have it, but I would want it just to be sure you have the right family. Religion, Greek, Catholic. We know names of siblings. It's another double check. If you know you had a brother John and a sister Mary, you can look for the entire family. If you find the other children, chances for success go up exponentially. And we have the name of the village. If you have that, you're going to be successful. So yes, you go to Europe. No, you continue plug, plugging on using U.S. records hmm. to obtain the necessary information. Now, you've got the name of the village. What's next? And what do we do with it? Let me go through an example. And there probably are people from this particular village living in this area here. Particularly the ones that live in Carbondale and Simpson, there are people from Stavisha village. So we know Stavisha. You can consult, first of all, the, it's, it's a really a Bible for doing Lemko or Polish research in general. The Genealogical Gazetteer of Galicia by Brian Lemus. I have a copy over there. So let's go to the book and see what... Okay, that's the book. We can go to the next one, okay? Stabby shot. And so you read over. Again. Present day district is Grebo. Judicial district, Grebo. It's in Poland. Roman Catholic parish in Grebo, Greek Catholic parish in Schnitzer. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we can go to the Family History Library catalog, which I alluded to in the first talk, the Mormon <coughs> website, and you can type in the locality. And you'll see that they have Greek Catholic baptisms 1777 to 1867. Now, uh, okay, go to the location, locality, section, the place, search under the library catalog. And we type in the name, Schnitzer. Hit the search button, and this comes up. Two entries. They're essentially the same entry. One has the modern geographic entity, Poland, Zhezhov, Sznitza, and the former Gorlitz County. And the present, I should say present Gorlitz County. And then the earlier, Austria, Galicia, Nietzsche in the former Rebov County, which would be the way it would be listed by an immigrant during the time period we're talking about. So if you click on either one of those blue lines, you come up with this. There are going to be church records for this location. So we click again on that blue. Mm -hmm. Click on that. And you see this, which means symmetrical books, 
church books, 1777 to 1947, Church Free Catholic Parish Schnitzer. So it sounds like we got the right deal. So let's see. After cooking again, you're going to get carpal tunnel by the time we're here. You come up with this, which is the same information. And in order, and it says two rolls of microfilm. In order to get the microfilm roll numbers, you got to click on that button that says view film notes. And finally, after it's an exhausting search, you see that it's Items of interest are located on that microfilm and on that microfilm. In this case, on the eighth item on the roll. In this case, on the first and second. And what do you have? Births, 1777 to 1785. Marriages, 1777 to 1785. That's similar. Then you have births again, or baptisms, 1814. Marriages, 1812, and so on. And you have the births up to 1867. Okay? We order the microphone. We look at those registers. No person. We don't find anything for Stavisha. Stavisha. What gives? Well, it turns out Stavisha was a part of that parish, but the priests maintained separate books for each of the villages that he administered to. So, you got to go back again to the catalog and type in Stavisha. Are there records? Yes. The births for 1777-1872. Would this help us? Turns out we need something in 1890. What next? Well, we have that database I told you to go to. Shazam. I feel like I'm on the, uh, <laughs> the, sh the show here. <laughs> the old cartoon show. Go to Shazam. <coughs> Click on databases. Go down to vinyl records. Click on that, type in Stavisha, hit search, and we see that there are additional births up to 1900 for the town, and if we, I don't know if I have it, but if you click on the, the side here, it says more, it says that they have these records in one of the branch archives, the, one of the branches for the Jejo of archive, is located in this place, Scholzing or Scholzing, and it gives you the address and an email, so you can make inquiry there. Will you search the records? How much will it cost me? Can I go there and look at them? But the answer to the question is you can get the record, and once you have that record, you can then tap into the earlier record. You've got to make the correct link. Now there's an, another way of approaching it other than using that database. A lot of these records were more or less centralized, not only into archives, but into local civil registration districts. The key is to try to figure out where, where do they put these records. If they're not in your town, they're going to be somewhere in the near vicinity, a larger town, and it's not always easy to figure out, but the LDS Church and its Family History Centers has this microfilm number, microfiche, I should say. You could look at it, you could look up Stavisha, you could find out where the records were located and write, there are Polish form letters you can get, to write to that civil registry office and ask, do you have records. If they don't have, often they will tell you where they are located. Um, sometimes they put a donation in, 10 bucks for their time. Sometimes they send it back. It's usually they keep it. But uh, 
That's a different way. There's the other ways as well. Now, what are some of the problems? <laughs> Surnames, if you're dealing with, and these are once you get the actual church records and you're looking at them. Female endings change, and you see that often in the records. So you might think, as in the case this morning, that the surname was Lepaka, but the, actually the surname is Lepa. Uh, in the language, the usage of the name in a sentence depends, you know, the, they add endings on it, depending on how, you, how it's being used. So you have to keep that in mind, and I'll talk about that. Sometimes you have place name change problems, and you have surname changes, which are farm names. Uh, there are too many people in the village with the same surname, and they can't sort them all out. And it happens they're living on a farm that was owned by somebody else with a less common name. So they just adopt the name of the farm, and they say, well, that's uh, Joe Svita, but he's living on the, the Barron farm, so we're going to call him Joe Svita Barron, or Joe Barron Svita, or whatever. And after a while, one of the names gets dropped, and it's usually the birth name that gets dropped. And they're using the alias. So we have all these alias problems as well. If you happen to have a rare name, sometimes this indicates that you have one of these farm names. And you'll do research in the records. You'll find your name for a couple of generations, then all of a sudden, it's gone, and you think, well, they moved in from another village, which may be the case, but they still may be there under their original birth name. And you have to think, can this possibly be a surname problem? Okay. Now, on the Lemko side, from the records, and I don't know if this is true, I don't know enough about Slavic linguistics to know this, except that you do find OWA, now, nowadays, or OVA, depending on the country, indicating uh, a female person uh, by the ending. So, uh, Sable, a female Sable, Sableova. You can find OWNA tacked on to the surname. You can find SKA, and the name might be ending in SKI. They changed the ending to SKA. Uh, they can add A-N-I-A or C-H-A. <coughs> so the way around it is if you're studying a particular village, look at every name for a male. Um, baptisms, look for the father's name and make a list of the surnames and put it in alphabetical order so that when you see the female endings, you can subtract the endings and come up with the original surname, otherwise you're going to come up with some brand new surnames, I can definitely state that. And you can see that, on this usually you get the uh, maiden name, but in this particular case, they just used the husband's name and made a female ending to it, like they do in many churches today. So the original name was Sirota. Shirota, and they add the ending on it. So that may look like a new surname, but it's the same there. Uh, same here. Yats, Yatsova, Phil, Felic, Felicia, and uh, Benia becomes Benicia. So if you're not aware of that, then you're going to come up with some new names. And often, sometimes you'll get you write for records, you'll get information sent back to you in a paragraph form. And you might not be aware of these gender sensitive problems. So, for example, this Polish sentence really means Pelagia or Pelagia, daughter of Danko Marcia. Danko is a diminutive form of Daniel. Similarly here, the word Zona means wife. Ahafia, wife of Fedor <coughs> Telep. And that Fedora Telep. And here it means Eva, daughter of Mihal Jamal. 
just be aware of these things. That's all. Yeah, the same thing that I was talking about. Child, Stefan, is the son of John, or Jan. Nasta, the uh, daughter of Michael, Anton, uh, the son of Michael. Okay. Some of you may have some of these names in your pedigree, all of which are derived from place names. They mean at some point that they originated from these towns. Uh, that would be a common assumption. Kozlovsky from Krislov. Zabodsky from Zabada. Yeah. All right, now we're getting into things where you have to look at all the records of the locality and really make some mental notes. For example, <coughs> the wife of Stefan Jurov is, that's a T, Tatska or Tatiana, daughter of Nat Wurtzniatskiego. Okay. We'll look at another one. Try to remember her, her information. Here's another entry where she's not Tatska anymore, but Tatiana, born of the parent Ignatio Virchniansky. From Virchniansky-Ego to Virchniansky, but the given name was Inat, Ignatius, in English, okay? So now we'll go, let's go back a generation. Here's the Ignatz Virchniansky from Virchny. Okay. <laughs> Ignatius Virchniansky from the town of Virchny. So you can see Virchny, Virchniansky is a locality form of the surname. And let's look at another record. Now we have Ignatius Basilio a farmer of Wurchne, and Maria, whose father is Basilio, or Basil, Koban of Stavisha. Let's look at another one. Now we have Ignatz Basilko of Wurchne, Wir and Maria Basilko, well, Basilkova. She's got her husband's name. Okay, let's go look at another one. Here we have Ignazi Basilko, a landowning person of Virchne, and Maria, just plain old Maria. Let's look at another one. So, let me just summarize what you just looked at. You had if you would have stopped at some point, you would have had Ignatius or Inat Virchniansky-Ego as your name. And you looked at another one, you had Ignatz Virchniansky of Virchne. And you go back earlier, and you have Ignatz Basilio. And then you go back another another earlier one, and you have Ignatz Basilko. His birth name was Ignatz Basilko. But if he went back and forth between a few towns, he was known as the man that came from Virchne, and his original name was lost in the woodwork, and he just said, well, he's Inat from Virchne. And that became Inat Virchniansky. So I'm saying you have a, yeah. a change going on here, and if you stop at some point without looking at everything possible, you might come to some erroneous conclusion. So why do we have the surname? <coughs> the name is too common in the village. I have one in my 
couple in my grandmother's house, Kobach and Svita. Svita changed the name to Gaggio, which is certainly uncommon. But when you go back to the old village, you have some that say Gaggio and some have Svita, and it turns out she was born in Svita. There were too many Svitas on there. What happens if the male, if the female of the family inherits land? And the husband, of course, hey, I'm the husband. That's my land. Okay, you get to have the land, but in order to keep peace in my family, you've got to change your name to my name. <laughs> he says, a land? Yes, sir. <laughs> and that happens. And he assumes the female name. Sometimes you get a surname <coughs> change that's honorary. It's such a big shot in the village that they change your name. Uh, they call you the village mayor of such and such, and your name gets changed because you're a big shot. This is one that I haven't seen too often. Yeah, sometimes our clues in the records themselves as to look for a name change. In this case, Jan Benia, Ivan Benia, in a Chaco, in a Che Kowalczyk. He was born Benia, but they called him Kowalczyk. Kowalczyk. Mm -hmm. And later generations became Kowalczyk. And then they come to the U.S. and they're Kowalczyk. And then they go back to the old country and they get to a certain point and you find out they're not really Kowalczyk, they're Benias, but there's a lot of Benias in the village. So, and then people get really a little wacky about it. Oh, that's not my name. It, it is your name. It hasn't changed. And here's another record showing Gregory Capitula and Eva Capitula. And I think he gives the name of the father there is John Ivan Capitula. Nothing unusual yet. Except when you go back earlier, his name wasn't Capitula. His name was Gregory Lenaric meaning Miller, and her name was the Capitola. And we looked at some other record. <coughs> and it was Gregory, Gregory Molinari and Eva Capitola. Yeah. And he dies at the age of 90. And so Gregory Molinari called Capitola. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And then the Capitola came all the way down to the present in Jersey City. And I said, you know, your name really originally wasn't Capitola. Mm -hmm. But it was changed to it. <laughs> now, how do you have the, overcome these surname problems? As I mentioned earlier, make a list of all the surnames in the village using the male names. It's good for you in two ways. You get, it's easier to read the records. As you get familiar with them, you know what names to be on the lookout for. You know the names of the witnesses will be easier to figure out. Some of these squiggles can be impossible. If you know possibilities, you can say, that's the one. So I advise to, to do that. <coughs> this is the one I did it for a lot of shows. I had all these names that I came up with, typed them up. Yeah. And writing. Oh, God. <laughs> can be tough even when you have a lot of experience. You sometimes get in your mind, it's got to be this. If you're going with a set idea that this name is going to be there, your eyes and your brain starts telling you, well, it, it, this is it. There are times when I'm going back and forth and reading documents in <coughs> Cyrillic and Hungarian, in other words, in other languages. Half the times I don't even remember, you know, going back and forth here, looking at Cyrillic and I'm saying, you know, what's going on here? I don't recognize it. And other times you, you just go a little bit crazy, your brain is working a little too hard and uh, you got problems. So let's look at a couple of examples. This I gave you as the handout. This I found to be very helpful in trying to decipher surnames in particular, uh, I just went through and made an alphabet 
of known words and known letters, and it helps you to decipher unknown names and terminology and what's like the next one. Yeah, and you should do not only single letters but known word combinations like mm -hmm. Polish. You'll always find SCCZ as a, as a unit and CZAK and CZ is common too. And of course, SKI is common, meaning son of. So if you know combinations of letters, then you're doing not only letter by letter, but you're getting to the heart of the matter a lot sooner. Illegitimacy, as I mentioned earlier, very common. If you have records in the United States, marriage records, and the bride and groom, and you find that the groom, they only list the wife's, uh, the mother's name, and on the wife's side, they list both names. You better start <coughs> thinking right away, there's a problem here. It may be an illegitimacy. Now, there are times when children are illegitimate, and in order to avoid <coughs> embarrassing situations, they'll make up the name of a father as well. So. Sometimes you have to go with your gut feeling. Handwriting can be nice as well. Don't get used to it though. <laughs> right. Here's that illegitimacy. Ignomen patric, father, unknown. In most cases, the priest would try to elicit the name of the father from the young lady and uh, without success. If she did give the name, it's often noted somewhere on there. Imputed father. Sometimes the priests get a little nasty and put deflorata, which oh. means she wasn't yeah. a maiden. Yeah. She was a maiden, I should say, when she had a child. Uh, some, of, some of the German records can get even nastier. Talk about the whore, this, the that. Mm. Especially when they, I should say, the illegitimacy tends to repeat itself. If you have one, and it's easy, it's easy to have another one and another one without the benefit of marriage. And then uh, sometimes it extends into generations. So mm -hmm. I've seen that happen. No records available through the, the Mormon library. As I mentioned, you can try corresponding with record sources in Poland, Slovakia, or Ukraine. Before, I, I, I have now used the researcher fairly extensively in Poland, so I don't write that often anymore. But when I did write to the Registry offices, for example, for Vladishov Village, I had early records, I needed the later ones. I wrote to this office and pushed Chief Gorlitsky and requested the marriage records for these towns and these people. And it, they type in the certificates, the information, 24 years old, 20 years old, residences and places of birth, names of parents and so on. Um, you can use these records to bridge gaps. Is that their form? That's their form. Okay. They, a lot of the reg registry offices, only because they've done it this way for years, prefer to take the information from the church books and type it onto these forms. Now, there's okay. usually information in the, ver in the church books that they don't type into the form. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. I've gotten one recently, though, where they just photocopied the entry, blocked out every other one, mm -hmm. photocopied it, and sent it to the researcher. But they are old-fashioned, and uh, they don't like to do that. So you have to pay a fee before you... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've often <coughs> sent over, uh, depending on how many I ask for, 10 or 20 bucks in an envelope, and... Usually it does the trick. The last time I did it, they claimed that somebody took the money and
and they didn't get it, which I didn't buy, but they gave the information anyway. Um, I just find it's a whole lot easier. It's, it takes weeks to get an answer anyway, so now I have a researcher that will, will go to these offices or write, and it's a lot easier. Yeah, and we pay her by a Western Union. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned earlier in the program about that Rose Chambora, born around 1870. Here's her birth entry here. Born in 1868, pretty close. Mm -hmm. Two years. Father was not Blazar, but Nazar, yeah. son of Elias Chambora and Mary. Yashkowski, farmer in Yashkola, and Pelagia, daughter of Andrew Hubiak and Aqu Aquilina Demchak. A very unusual name, Aquilina. Mm -hmm. Aquilina. Uh, so that Bellagia was Pel Pelagia Pauline in English, and the father was Nazar, Nazarius. So that's written out. Okay. okay. So with that information we had from Old Forge, <coughs> you know, I was able to go back and, and the records for that time were fairly limited on the LDS, but I got back couple of generations with approximate dates and uh, sometimes it leads to areas for example Stavisha which had better records and I was able to give more information back to the client. That's the Shambora continuation so if you have if you're Village has good records back to the 1780s, which is typical. You can usually get your oldest immigrant back to anywhere from 1720 to 50, an approximate birthday. So that's not too bad, all things considered. I want to talk a little bit about some websites that should be of interest to you. Uh, there's one at lenco.com. Org, or he, Walter Maximovich. He's a Lemko and has a tremendous exhibit, information-wise, photographs, maps. And, you know, he gives you topics there. <coughs> very, it's a very good site. If you have Lemkos, you should look. At. If you don't have, you should look at. It. This we should all look at. The Carpatha Rusa Knowledge Base. There's a tremendous amount of information about our people. Somebody mentioned before the Boykos and Kupsuls. There may be some information there. Although it's a work in progress, I'm not sure. But and then some information contributed by various people to the site. There's also a uh, You'll see there's a, below, right below, there will be a Lemco database where you can um, click on the village name and it'll give you every surname found in the village for the census of 1787, I believe it is. And it'll give you a little background information, what the name of the church was, how many people lived there at a certain time period. Very good information. Including uh, Ukraine? Uh, no, because that's this is the Lemko <laughs> side. You can get that from that 1877 gazette here. Okay. All right. It's another great one, the Carpathian Connection. So the, the Uyak people, this is the one you need to look at. Uh, there's a database somewhere below that says Uyak with my name on it. Click on that and you can check for your shed lock. This is excellent. It has a lot of links to good sites, a lot of information about various groups and villages, and, and good background material. The 
Carpatho Lucent Society. I gave you a handout. Everybody here should join. Uh, this I thought was interesting and new. There's a Carpatho Lucent radio program on every Sunday in Pittsburgh. And if you have an internet connection, they download the material to the net so you can click on it and listen to the half hour programs about current events or happenings in the Pittsburgh area and they play music from the homeland. It's, it's very nice. This one is <coughs> Eastern Slovakia from Karpeta Rusin. Uh, they have the uh, building your family tree online, question and answer forum. You can post questions and get answers on your questions. Uh, everything about the culture, the foods, celebrations. Uh, tremendous sight. Those of you who are looking for a good researcher in Poland, Lemko, this is the person to contact. She speaks English. You can email her at that address. She knows all about Lemkos now. She's mm -hmm. an expert on Lemkos. Knows where to find the records. Knows what information to get out of them. Uh, depending on how the depth of the record source, it could cost you maybe uh, $300 for her to pull out data on your village. At all names, for almost just about every name that you're working on. Uh, she'll do a full day's research. And uh, she sends the information to you via email. There are no documents involved because it costs somewhere around $10 per document to, to copy things in Poland. So most. Most Rusins won't pay the freight, so she'll grab all the information out for you and send it to you via email. What's her work page if you can't do it? Her email is, this is from the Polish Genealogical Society webpage. It's called Ivona's Notebook. You can probably type that in and do a search on that. It's the Polish, Polish Genealogical Society of America. <coughs> O-N-E-T dot No, that's her, that's her email. Right. <coughs> okay, that's the last of the, uh, the Lemco deal. Question? Uh, do you have any history about the uh, large numbers of Ukrainians who settled in Western Canada, or and or would some of these be actually Lemkos? Uh, I would say can? there may be some Lemko in there. Mo probably not, though. I've seen uh, there was a whole series of books on ethnic groups. There was one on Ukrainians that went into some of that detail. Uh, I'm trying to remember <coughs> the other. One. But there are books that detail the immigration, the Ukrainian immigration to uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba yeah, and yeah, so on, yes. Alberta. Uh, yes, I was wondering, the churches that we have in this area, the business in the Catholic churches, the Catholic churches, whatever you want to call them, would you, would the consensus then be that the churches that were established were from people of certain areas, Correct. or were these reasons mm -hmm. just from everywhere? No. I mean, my grandfather was the founder of the church in Spain, which was one of the first mm -hmm. I had this church, um, St. Mary's. And those records are on microfilm, by the way. Oh, they are? Mm -hmm. For who? St. Mary's in Scranton. Where are they? On Mifflin okay. Avenue? Yeah. 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 St. Mary's Greek Catholic? the oldest churches. In okay. Now, St. Vladimir's Ukrainian Catholic Church split off from St. Mary's. Yeah, but that was because they didn't, they, they were all, the way I understood it, and it's really quite interesting because I do have a quite an extensive history from the church that was printed by the church, but there's a lot of churches that came from St. Mary's because St. Mary's was the first. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the churches in this area came from St. Mary's originally, all over the Mid-Valley, 
down the other direction as well. But I, I guess my question was, because all of these people were of a minority and they started a church, for example, like Jack and Bella relations were in a, a section that I grew up in. Oh, and there was a small, there's a church there, which is only several blocks really from St. Mary. But they, as the people had different sections, they started churches so they wouldn't have as far to go, I guess. Because mm -hmm. from St. Mary's in Scranton, they came as far as Taylor and Oldport yeah. originally. That, but you true. said that's on what? And where do I find that? In like, LDS. Okay. That's microfilm. Oh, microfilm. Microfilm. St. Mary's, <coughs> Scranton. Also, uh, Holy Resurrection in Wilkes-Barre. Okay. Orthodox. Oh. But that has a lot of, a lot of Lemco there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was another early church. Father Lemco. Yeah, but it was, if you got to remember, they were all, most of them were originally Greek Catholic. Exactly. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay. What's the but name of the one in Wilkes-Barre again? Holy Resurrection Cathedral. Oh. But I think with St. Vladimir, they began their own church because they were Ukrainian. They were not, you know, they were not Carpathian Rus, which I heard all my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, they, I were they were Ukrainian. Ukrainian. There was a different, there was a difference. So they wanted their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the reason. I don't think there was a problem there. It was just a matter of their own identity. Like they didn't leave under bad conditions. They just left because they wanted to establish their own church and their own identity. At least that's my understanding. But there's been an awful lot of that in any area you go to, in some very small areas. And we found out that my husband's great uncle and my grandfather were on the committee to start St. Mary's Church, and we never knew that. And I mean, we weren't up married, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in spite of it. <laughs> when, they, when they found these churches, they tend to be people that were, that knew one, one another, the same village kind of deal. Uh, you know, initially when there were a few churches, there wasn't much of a choice. If you wanted to go to a church of your kind, right. you went to Scranton no matter how far away exactly. the church was, you know, particularly to baptize a child or whatever, they were firm about doing it fairly quickly. And if there was no other church, rather than go to a Polish church or a Slovak church or whatever, if there happened to be one, they would go the distance to do it. But after a while, you know, well, I understand in St. Mary's, they actually went to Old Forge and kidnapped the priest. I mean, that's in their history. That is in their history, in their own bicentennial history, I've read that. <laughs> you have to remember, these, these histories are written with a slant. <laughs> and all of the ones, all of the ones from the Byzantine parishes, uh, they always are very careful to skirt the ethnicity <laughs> issue. If you get a priest to say that uh, there were Carpeto Rus, and that's, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Because they they will say they came from the Carpathian Mountains in Austria Hungary and they stop yeah. because uh, they the priests will get killed by somebody, <laughs> some faction or other, <laughs> if they dare mention Carpathian right? Rus and or, or things like that. Now they're coming around a little bit, but <laughs> ethnicity is very <coughs> de-emphasized if you go to the Byzantine church today because it causes problems no matter what. You're going to pick somebody else. I think that's true. In some families, there are just different kinds of people. And some people just were prouder or maybe gutsier, just to use that word. And if there were splits, <laughs> like there were uh, in virtually every town. You right. can name a town, I can tell you the exactly. split. But when they, when they write the history, uh, they'll gloss over it. Well, originally, we went to the church on First Street, but we decided we needed our own church. And they don't say that, you know. We thought this guy was spending money wildly, and we left. Or this guy did this or that. Uh, they that gets glossed <coughs> over, and history starts from the time they say it starts, right. and it may not coincide <laughs> with the anniversary. Well, we heard a lot. I even in my generation heard a lot of stories, and they weren't nice. So I have a feeling they were true. There was a lot. <laughs> 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 there was a lot of rancor. I've read enough of these. Yeah histories, and I've done research in the newspapers where god-awful things what? were put in print that, that they, <coughs> you couldn't do now. It wasn't politically correct. Uh, I think some really scurrilous things. I usually bring a quote from the newspaper, and I'll try to paraphrase it. It was a little blurb in the paper about 
Uh, I think the title was Hungarian with jawbreaking name goes to post office to pick up a letter for him. And it was a whole thing about, you know, we didn't trust this guy. He had no papers to prove who he was. He had this, uh, he was big and heavy and had this really hard look and we didn't trust him. And he, we wouldn't give him the letter and he said, I'm gonna jump over the counter and whip you guys. And it was <coughs> unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Sounds like early Jerry Springer. Probably wasn't far from it. I'm very interested in the history of why our ancestors moved around and how they came over here. For example, I know some in my family uh, married people from the Lemco region who were coming south to Trieste to get out of there. And I know somebody from the Carpathian Russian side, when they were finally leaving, this is all within like uh, 1904 mm -hmm. to 1907, mm -hmm. okay, they went up through Bremen, and there was oh. a story that they had to cross a border, mm -hmm. okay, and they, were, you know, they had to come over in the, you know, in the wagon, and they had to hide the wagon, all kinds of stories like that. Uh -huh. But is there any history from, let's say, 1850 to 1912 that would tell why they did things? I can tell you the reason why. Before 1905, <coughs> most Rusins left by a Bremen or Hamburg. After 1905, the Cunard Line got a monopoly on transporting people from our area, and they went through Trieste. Pembrae. Yeah. And so even though the Austro-Hungarian <coughs> immigration was not su was supposed to be denied, they couldn't stop it, so they said, if we can't stop it, we gotta make money on it somehow, so they cut a deal. I think they promoted it. Yeah, though. it was promoted after a while. Right. They said, well, there's more money in, in letting these people go than trying to keep them here. When they, they were less starving here. to death because of it, and that so you'll they see most of them that came. Too. On Cunard Line and mm -hmm. through Trieste, and uh, sometimes if you can't find your people on the Ellis Island, and they came through Hamburg, there are Hamburg departure lists where you can pick them up, find them, but you got to read the, the German handwriting, so you can pick <coughs> them up there. On the Hamburg list, my grandparents when they came over, one came over from Bremen and the other Hamburg, and actually put Lithuanian on it, and that's the first time. I didn't even know what Julian meant until mm -hmm. I did a research. Mm -hmm. so I never even heard that word before. Now, that term would be used for both our people and Ukrainians. It's synonymous. <coughs> it's it's a, a general term yeah. for anybody from that area. And I know in our church in Bridgeport, Connecticut, our church was always known as Carpathian Lucent. Mm -hmm. Which church, which church is it? St. John. Mill Hill Avenue. Oh, Mill Hill, yeah, that's, that's uh, Orestes Chorin. Right. He was the one that started the whole Johnstown Diocese. Oh. He was one of the troublemakers. He and the, there were two other priests that started the whole Johnstown deal. And, and it was for the right reason, you know, that, that they were denied the opportunity to marry before becoming priest. That was a uh, time-honored tradition, mm -hmm. which was being denied by the Vatican and not really upheld by the Bishop Takach, who felt between, he was between the rock and the hard place, took the road of following <coughs> the superior mm -hmm. and really caused a, a schism beyond belief. That's when most of these a lot of these parishes just went to Johnstown and others. They went back and forth, you'll find. They went to Johnstown Diocese, and then the parish went to o OCA or whatever. There's a lot of back and forth movement to get what they considered to be you know, the correct church with the correct priest, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, because my family was split. Like, my cousins went to... Oh, yeah. Uh, a Greek Catholic church, and, and we went to Orthodox mm -hmm. church, and then I never knew what I was, Russian, Ukrainian, mm -hmm. growing up, mm -hmm. you really didn't know what to say, it's well mm -hmm. <laughs> That That's typical. Mm -hmm.
Um, Turk and Colonel, uh, people used to go to Lancaster to, to be Catholic church. Then they formed the church in Colonel. And there was a group of people that lived over the mountain out of it. They come to church, they used to come up, uh, take a train in, and then come up a back alley. And on a corner of uh, one of the streets, right by the church here, there's a lady who used to call her Baba Labia. And uh, on Sundays, in the church, you had no pews when they first built, mm -hmm. so you had to stand. And they said, you could tell where everybody from Pado stood, because there was a puddle of water in church there. <laughs> Baba, Baba Labia, she used to stand on her thumb porch with a, a bench with a big galvanized uh, buck, uh, like a tub. And she had water, and everybody that came from Pado, she threw a bucket of water on them. So sure. they came to church and stood for <coughs> two hours. <laughs> so they used to clean the church only on Sundays. And they used to pick them off and just walk the floor. What a story. That's a good family tradition in fact, don't you? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> One thing I haven't heard you say, the, the word anywhere in this whole thing, was Czechoslovakia. I think there is no such thing. Because I've seen, I've seen on uh, census Czechoslovakia work for you. Well, Austria Czechoslovakia Hungary. existed between 1920 and 1938. That's the only right. time. When people come up to me and say they're Czechoslovakian, I just go nuts. You're either <laughs> Czech or you're Slovak, or maybe right. neither one of them. Right. Yeah. Uh, probably not. Probably not when you not say either. that. Right. Uh, but I just go nuts because. But that's what there was never such a being. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what, uh, oh yeah, we're Czechoslovakia. Because that was the time period right. when Czechoslovakia came yeah. forth from Austria-Hungary. Was that was that because no. it became like a more recognizable entity? It was a country. No, country? It was a the definable way. area. Right. Okay. Right. It's because better to say you know, from Czechoslovakia to Ruthenia or Karpatsk. Yeah, I never heard anybody in our family say, oh, Austria-Hungary. That was on the that was on the documents, but but it was always out for checking the When you leave here today, are you going to tell somebody you moved? Isn't it been a lot easier to say? And I like my guys, my guys say Germany. You go back, it's not Germany, it's Prussia. But he wrote what it was at the time that the document was written. So sometimes you just do the easiest thing. It's yeah. a heck of a lot yeah. easier oh, yeah, to say absolutely. you're Czechoslovakia. It's a lot easier to say you're German and people, you're really people, Prussian and Russian. People recognize that. They've heard the... the they know what Czechoslovakia is. They don't know Russian. Russian. What's that? They never heard of it. Yeah. I think he said a few things that really touched the, the heart. Uh, there was a schism here in Oliver back in 1947. St. Cyril's of Authority is Greek Catholic Church right there. St. Andrew's right across the river right there. I was president, you go down past St. Cyril down here, you can see a magnificent building. It was built in 1928. They had $100,000 in the bank at that time. I was the president for forever at the church at St. Cyril's. And they were told they were really the priest controlled the money. And they said, no, 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 the people control the money. Mm. And with that, a lawsuit was thrown against the, the, uh, the Board of Trustees at St. Cyril's. They figured they would lose the Lackawanna County in Pennsylvania, but they knew the State Supreme Court would uphold that because they had the western part, the Pittsburgh area, they went through that multiple times to Ukrainian churches. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court always said, no, no, this is the church belongs to the people. Well, in essence, they did. The Supreme Court in 1950 or 51 ruled St. Cyril's was a, was a was actually Greek, was Roman Catholic. And it was an interesting comment. I'm very sorry, we just had this opponent lately across the river. All these books from these lost and three books they all disappeared before I got involved with the breaking of the household. They, um, they said, they, a Jesuit came up from, from uh, Georgetown and testified right down here in Stratton and said, Greek Catholic one means one thing. To the educated clergy was Roman Catholic. To the ignorant peasant, from that point on, I was never Greek Catholic or anything like that. Instantaneously. I never wanted to be a, a peasant. I'm really a more than an ignorant person. So the thing is, if you want to see historical fighting, infighting, all you have to do is go out two blocks from here and you're done. 
the uh, <coughs> St. Cyril's. Most of the people that went to St. Cyril's were Rusins. Right. And when I showed that picture, I said village people. Mm -hmm. That was taken in St. Cyril's, that group. Mm -hmm. But there's as many stories like that as there are in Pine Cat Pickles. Right. And instead of a group of people that were very small and a minority to begin with, sticking together, all we did is split and split and split. And we had we lost and strength, our strength went with it. It's and exactly again, right. I think that if you're familiar with history, the um, Roman Catholic Bishop of Scranton, Pennsylvania, did control the, um, the Byzantine or Greek Catholics in this area because they were Catholics. And that's where a lot of the historical uh, information came in because they were subject to him and that's why the Supreme Court ruled that way. However, you know, it's just too bad that it, it plagues me because I listened to my grandmother for years. I lived next door to her and I heard those stories. I thought I was born in Europe. I heard about those villages and what my entire life. But consequently, I think it's the issue that we were just such a small group of people and we've become so fragmented. And most of it was our own doing, mm -hmm. which is so tragic, I think, personally. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, can I say something? <coughs> you know, exactly what you're saying now just hit me like a, like a ton of bricks. We rent over there from the All Saints Church. We've been renting from them for six years. And there's another guy in that building. He and his wife have been renting for 35 years. And when we first moved in there, the older board, if you will, of the church was thrilled to have us because it was income for the church. Now there's a new board. And they decide the building's a white elephant. They don't want it anymore. They're going to borrow money to tear it down. And it's built like a bomb shelter. <laughs> and nobody can convince them they shouldn't tear it down because all you hear from these four members on the board is it's our property. We'll do with it as we wish. Um, and everybody else in the church says, well, how are you going to fight City Hall? Um, and the building's going to get torn down. Right, and I yeah. said, this is such stupid thinking. Yeah. You know? yeah. But it's, it's our yeah. thinking. It's our, yeah. our people. That's the way they think. Yeah. I don't want to make waves. Let them tear it down. And, and a good piece of property goes to waste. For it, as in a church, the church goes to waste. Yeah. Didn't the dispute between the who has jurisdiction over the Byzantine churches and property and the dispute about married or unmarried priests lead to or foment or support the movement, the Greek Catholic Union, which I understood started in and around Wilkes-Barre, the Scranton area? Greek Catholic Union <coughs> was a real troublemaker entity unto itself. They were big supporters of the Brucin rights, the married clergy, the whole nine yards. So whenever they got whiff of change, they sprang into action, started writing articles. The people would get all cranked up. Mm. And they were right, but you know, it's, it still caused a lot of havoc. You could read, uh, like I showed you, the, the headlines there. For the whole history of our people, okay. that's the way it's been. Yeah, now we 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 lost our rights. You know, that's that's sad. They're probably going to go back for the married clergy. That means you had all of this divisiveness and nonsense over something that never should have happened, but it happened. Gotta, you got to go with the flow now. What do you think really promoted that? The clergy being, not being married anymore. I mean, what was the underlying basis for all that? Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Exactly. That's 12th century. Huh. Yeah. Why should they be allowed to marry and, 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 right. and be Catholics? Right. And then the Roman right. Catholic priests say, hey, maybe I want to I wanna <coughs> marry. Why can't I marry? Were the people themselves who are members of that church beginning to think also that um, the priest's children were all being educated, weren't they? Presumably. Where, the, where the members of the church themselves probably couldn't afford to educate their kids, true? Sure. That was so a, was yeah. that the other side of the coin? Yeah, it was a fact. I don't know where they were educated. I mean, there really weren't too many parochial schools uh, at the time of uh, no, a lot of these priests. No, talking about higher education. Yeah, uh, you college, mean yeah. college or yeah. that? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if there's any information Well, we saw some of that here, that. that as people began to think, as, as these so-called peasants, and that's what we were, you know, as they came to this country and they worked hard and their families began to grow and got a little edu more educated, that they were starting to question how could the priest who had seven children 
educate in three or four doctors when their children weren't even able to get out of high school. That was a confirmed contention. Somebody For remembers Father Patrick. It was. <laughs> it was that way from the word go, though. Yeah, that's yeah. true. And the priests <coughs> were held in high regard. Right. However, they were the village officials. I mean, they kept they records the education. Right. in the old country. Who else could be right? Right. <laughs> The story I heard was uh, many years ago that uh, uh, it, most of the, uh, the bishops, uh, I don't know, was it in the eastern part of the state or where they were Roman Catholic, where they were Irish, and the Irish people were complaining how come the Greek Catholics were Catholic and yet they could marry an our priest can. So then they, they put it to Rome, and then Rome decided to mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, I understand there's about 1,100 Roman Catholic priests that have come over from other religions, Protestant religions, that are married in the Catholic Church. I think it's just a matter of time. Oh yeah, that's definitely. You know, patrician and they're going to have to we, were, we were close to uh, having the married clergy again in, in the Pittsburgh Archdiocese until the Metropolitan died untimely. Um, I think we were probably close to implementing it. And it's my understanding now that each individual bishop can decide whether or not to um, or ordain mm -hmm. the married man to the priesthood. Really However, with the older bishops, yeah. you know, this is it's not going to happen. Now what diocese are you talking about? <laughs> the Catholic diocese? The Christian the Byzantine? Oh, you are? This is Pataki? Yes. Okay. He has the power, I was told by one of the priests, but he won't, because I think he's a guinea. But it'll happen because they're just running short. Now they're running, this guy's running two or three parishes. So, you know, how, how stretched can you get? No way. I went to a...
His website, his uh, in email address is on the website. What I thought we'd do is just go around like I do my, to my students. This is when your project is due. You picked it out, don't yell at me. So if you want to pick out a number, whoever's number one, you see Tom first. If you're a couple, if you get the smaller number, you know, then you just move up. I hope this is, I try to be fair. I try to be fair and think of a, a good system. One more thing before we get to the fall. Can we do again next year in the fall? Yes.